morning, everyone. Good to see you here bright and early this morning. Hope everyone had a time to grab a bite because I think the buses are running a bit late today. Um, we're going to try and keep to time. So without further ado, I would like to um, start today's morning's presentation. A gentle reminder, please, to just silence your phones so that we can enjoy today's proceedings without any interruptions. My name is Kaylee. I'm from the NRF, and we're very happy to have you here with us again today. So um, welcome to day three of the summit. We're at the halfway point now. We will now start with the Young Scientist presentation. Um, I would like to invite Dr. Yang Le, Deputy De Department Head of the Institute of Materials Research and Engineering at ASTAR to chair this session. And we have our two presenters for today, Dr. Kosnit Lerato Rometsi and Dr. Xu Jianjing. So first, Dr. Yang, please. Our first presenter this morning, as I mentioned, is Dr. Kosnit Lerato Rometsi. So she's a PhD fellow in immunology at the University of Cape Town. Please do give her a warm welcome. I'll hand the mic now to you. Morning, everyone. Oh, there we go. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Chair, for the kind introduction. And a bigger thank you to this uh, organizing committee for affording me the opportunity to share my work with you today. My PhD characterizes certain aspects of the male genital tract at a basic immunological level with respect to HIV risk and susceptibility. And the, the aspect that I'll focus on today is the penile barrier function. I'll tell you now why it is important to learn about the basic science penile immunity. Although it's always important to acknowledge that a lot of progress has been made since the enrollment of antiretroviral treatment, as evidenced by the decrease in HIV-associated morbidity and mortality, HIV new infections remain significantly high globally, especially in South Africa. Therefore, um, it is important for us to focus as scientists to try and understand what mechanisms underlie HIV transmission and susceptibility mechanisms. It is well documented that the commonest mode of HIV transmission is by heterosexual intercourse and that the highest HIV burden in any sex or um, uh, age cohort is amongst women of reproductive age. As a consequence, a large majority of research to date has largely focused on HIV transmission mechanisms that are focused on male to female transmission and female acquisition in the, in the female genital tract, with HIV transmission mechanisms through the penile exposure being one of the least studied aspects of HIV research. It has also been sufficiently demonstrated by randomized controlled trials that medical male circumcision reduces HIV infections by 50 to 60 percent, particularly in areas of high prevalence. This then indicates that the foreskin plays an important role, but also that the other parts in the penile anatomy also contribute, explaining the remaining 40% risk. Interestingly, knowing this significant risk reduction in HIV infection following medical male circumcision, to date we still don't understand the mechanisms that underlie this observed significant reduction in risk. Furthermore, it is important for us to then explore these uh, factors to see what could be underlying these mechanisms and potentially use these um, identified factors to come up with alternative preventative strategies within the males. In our project, we look to characterize the female immune factors that un could potentially underlie susceptibility in the male genital tract, for one, and we ex explore, with respect to the penile barrier function, what could potentially change following circumcision. And we hope by doing this, um, we would then generate knowledge that could provide a stepping stones into identifying potential targets within the male genital tract uh, for alternative non-invasive HIV prevention strategies. HIV transmission is known to be amplified by multiple factors, one of which is asymptomatic STIs. Asymptomatic STIs, according to the WHO, in 2022, over one million sexually transmitted infections were acquired globally. That is both in developing and developed countries. And majority of those are asymptomatic STIs. And as we know, asymptomatic STIs could be virally caused, and that could be things like herpes. And it has been shown that about 75 to 90% of people have asymptomatic STIs. 
Um, additionally, things like um, uh, trichomonas vaginalis and also chlamydia are all, can also be examples of STS that are asymptomatically um, um, presenting in individuals. It has also been demonstrated by various studies that STIs increase one's ability to acquire HIV and to transmit HIV. Additionally, it has been shown that people living with HIV are more susceptible to acquiring um, STIs, classical STIs, therefore the bi-directional complex relationship. This is an important factor to uh, consider while looking at trying to understand susceptibility within the male genital tract. Now, to give you a brief, a brief schematic anatomical demonstration of the male uh, penis, shown here is an uncircumcised uh, penis and going through erection, but this is to uh, uh, adequately show you how the anatomy works. Uh, proximally is the shaft, extends into the outer and inner foreskin, the coronal sulcus with this junction between the glands and the shaft, and distally the glands and the urethral meatus. All these sites have unique immune environments that are all susceptible to acquiring HIV. Additionally, the male external genitalia arises entirely from the urogenital sinus embryologically. As a result, it consequently only exists or uh, uh, is, is lined with the, what we call the stratified squamous epithelia, which is shown here. The stratified squamous epithelia is part of the epidermal layer that uh, is part of the skin that uh, um, covers the penis. And it has been shown in literature that the, this um, epidermal layer, which is, uh, consists of five main stratas, that only the top layer is important in defining what we call barrier function in the skin. Therefore, what it implies is that maintaining the integrity of this layer is very important in, in ensuring that it uh, performs its function to prevent host invasion by microorganisms um, such as HIV. There are a few models that have been, uh, or, or models of um, measurements that have been approved or accepted to act as proxies to measure barrier function. One of which is what we call transepithelial water loss, which I will refer to as TWOL as the presentation goes on. And essentially, what uh, these models do is that they uh, can be measured using devices to, as a proxy to define barrier function. Uh, T-well, which is transepithelial water loss, is one of the key indicators for a good skin integrity. And it's been used vastly in literature, particularly in dermatological studies, to define barrier function. This is a, a model that we will use in, this, in our study to measure barrier integrity in the foreskin and the penis. Yes. And finally, as I mentioned that the stratum corneum is the main layer within the epidermis that defines barrier function. One of the two of the main components that ensures this function is performed are the organization of the cells themselves, which is the stratum uh, uh, stratified uh, squamous epithelia, but also what we call tight junction proteins. The skin consists of many proteins which are called tight junction proteins, but one that has been shown in literature to be very important in defining and making sure that the integrity of the skin is intact is what we call cloud in one. It has been shown by uh, Furisi uh, and, and others in literature that when they knocked out the cloud in gene uh, in mice models, they died immediately after birth due to severe uh, dehydration and compromised integrity of, the, of their skin. Now, having said that, our study main objective with regards to this aspect of the um, immunity function in the male genital tract, we seek to look at the barrier function both at, in the in vivo and ex vivo level of the uh, um, penile anatomical sites, and we also seek to see how this is affected by the presence of asymptomatic STIs and how circumcision status affects uh, barrier function. Could circumcision alter barrier function in the penile genital tract? We'll find out as I talk you through this presentation. Just to give you a brief overview of our methodology, um, around 720 male participants were recruited and initially uh, with this we uh, collected uh, first pass urine samples and foreskins. These were then used to screen for common STIs as noted on the screen. Surprisingly, um, there was, the screening revealed 
almost 20% uh, uh, prevalence of the different STIs. These are at the different regions in the um, Western Cape, South Africa. This data was then used to select two clinics that had the highest um, STI rates in order to do our primary study measures. From this subset, 203 male participants were then um, um, enrolled and recruited into the study and what we call meter, meter devices which are often used in dermatological studies which are uh, then um, uses um, modalities such as trans epithelial water loss and surface hydration were used to measure these modalities at different sites in the penile genital tract that is the shaft, the foreskin and the glands. As I mentioned all these sites are potential sites of HIV acquisition. Additionally, we had collaborative studies that were done in Chicago University of Northwestern, and they collected um, some data relating to barrier in integrity within males who were circumcised at birth, as opposed to the ones in South Africa. It's adults who actually decided to get circumcised at the adult stage, so we were able to measure before and after circumcision, whereas this cohort was a cross-sectional analysis where they just measured post, however many of years post um, uh, circumcision at birth. And again, alongside all these, we also uh, collected foreskins from which we extracted RNA, which are then used to perform qPCR for common tie junction proteins. Just to give you a quick summary of how the devices work, uh, I'm not going to go into the details because of time, but the first two devices essentially as the vapometer and the moisture SC, they measure uh, dynamics within the stratum corneum only, and the other two goes all the way deep into the uh, dermal areas. Important to note is that as part of uh, taking the meter measures, we also measured the environmental conditions, such as the relative humidity and temperature, and these showed a strong correlation between uh, uh, the readings and the meter readings, and therefore this was considered when we did the final analysis. In terms of results, uh, this first slide shows you the baseline characteristics. Now, what we did, is, as I said, when we measured the different anatomical sites on the penis and using this different meter machines, we looked at the different modalities. And important to note with the vipometer, which I noticed, to, which I noted to be the gold standard, we found that in pre-circumcised penises, when we measure um, at the glands, inner foreskin, and shaft there was a significant difference between the, the T-wall readings in the glands and the inner foreskin. The inner foreskin had the highest T-wall reading, which means that it had a less um, um, uh, or a compromise or less barrier function compared to the shaft. We also noted that this was followed by the glands, and again, it showed that there was more hydration in the different parts of the penis uh, compared to the shaft. We then again looked at this on a molecular level and we did qPCR for these um, various tie junction proteins. And what we found largely uh, shown in the red is the inner foreskin, in the blue is the outer foreskin. And we show, we show using qPCR that um, majority of these genes significantly are significantly expressed in a lower level in the inner foreskin compared to the outer foreskin, which could be a potential mechanism explaining why the inner foreskin has been described with in vitro infections to be more susceptible to HIV infections as opposed to the outer foreskin. But what was interesting in this case was that if you look at Claudin-1, which is the main tight junction that defines barrier function, there was no significant difference uh, between the inner and the outer foreskin, as well as filagrin. I'll get back to this when I go into another part of my results. So, firstly, here we looked at the impact of circumcision. So, looking at the cross-sectional analysis at the Chicago um, uh, cohort, what we did was that we compared uh, these modalities between the circumcised and the uncircumcised. And it was very clear that when you looked at the circumcised and uncircumcised, the uncircumcised showed that the glands, which was consistent with what we found in South Africa, had higher trans epithelial water loss, meaning that it was less, um, um, the barrier function was less intact compared to the shaft. But in the circumcised, as you can see, there's a significant difference in a shift of these measurements in the glands. We noted that there was no longer a difference between the shaft and the glands, indicating that circumcision uh, improves barrier function in the glands. Secondly, we also did a longitudinal measurement, although the follow-up was very limited due to COVID, but also social behavioral factors within males when it comes to health-seeking behaviors. But what we saw, what was interesting was that when you looked at the T-well, um, we 
followed up the measurements uh, three, at three visits uh, time points, that is two weeks, three months, and six months post circumcision. At six months post circumcision, there is a significant decline in the T well reading, which then suggests that what we notice to decrease um, in the glands actually happens way over time following circumcision. We also looked at the impact of asymptomatic STIs on these measures, and what we found was that there was no significant difference in the T well readings, but we found that in the stratum corneum there was increased moisture, which could implicate many things. I can't make valid conclusions, but we can say for sure that it will affect the microbiome and the kind of you know um, uh, microorganisms that. Um, that sit in the different anatomical sites and that could contribute to harboring an environment which could be friendly to HIV infections. This is where I show the, the significant difference here. And therefore it shows that uh, the presence of an asymptomatic alt STI alters the barrier function of the, it does not really alter the transepithelial water loss but it increases the moisture in the apical epithelial layer. Finally, we also looked at the impact of asymptomatic STIs on the expression of molecular molecules that uh, um, affect or influence the, the expression of um, barrier function within the foreskin. And what we see that is interesting in this case is that Cloudin 1 now shows a significant difference in expression between the inner and the outer foreskin when there is an asymptomatic STI, suggesting that um, the presence of an asymptomatic STI not only increases moisture within the apical layer, but it also compromises the barrier function, rendering the, the, the different sites, particularly the, the, the foreskin, more susceptible to HIV infection. So in summary, we've shown that prior to medical male circumcision, the penile glands and the inner foreskin have um, significantly lower barrier function as compared to the penile shaft. The glands and the inner foreskin have significantly increased water content and moisture, which could have implications in terms of the kind of environment it creates for microorganisms. We also show that medical circumcision at birth results in an improvement in barrier function within the glands, and has been shown in literature that the glands is one of the most HIV susceptible structure within the penile genital tract. So this is interesting that we show that medical circumcision, one of the underlying mechanisms would be the improvement of barrier function within the glands. We also show that cloud in one, which is significantly important in defining barrier function is affected or is the expression is decreased in the foreskin in the presence of an asymptomatic STI. And therefore, uh, these findings could be linked to HIV susceptibility mechanisms in the uncircumcised males and the presence of STIs. These could start giving us hints into potential targets in developing alternative preventative strategies, such as creating microgels, which could target uh, certain elements of um, barrier function um, defining factors. These are my references, and I would like to thank firstly my uh, supervisor, Professor Clive Gray, and um, all the participants that uh, were recruited and volunteered to be part of the study, uh, our collaborators and my funders. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ramatsi. Can I invite Dr. Young now to moderate the Q&A session? Um. <clears throat> Thank you so much, um, uh, Dr. Arametsi, for the very interesting talk on uh, the barrier functions of uh, male genitalia against HIV infections. Um, it's a very interesting topic. Uh, I hope you're all still bright-eyed and bushy-tailed at, uh, you know, 8-something a.m. in the morning. Uh, shall we have some questions, please, from the, from the audience? Please don't feel shy. And those of us who are online, joining us online uh, at this uh, hour, please feel free to send in your questions on the online platform, that's Slido. All right, any questions, please, from the audience? Oh, yeah. oh sorry, I didn't see that. Yeah, sorry. Please. Um, thank you so much, that was great. Um, I'm really impressed at the data that you've got, the fact that you can follow individuals pre and post um, circumcision. So I was wondering how you went about the recruitment for that. So we formed partnerships with, um, so in, in Africa, vol uh, me medical male circumcision is a free service, first of all. So there are circumcision clinics that are linked to either nonprofit organizations or governmental clinics. So we formed partnerships with those clinics. 
And usually post-circumcision, all the males are supposed to come back two weeks post-circumcision to do their checks. So that's how we got them into um, to get the follow-ups. But um, moving forward, they got compensation for uh, following up. Although we expected way more uh, numbers in terms of follow-up, especially at the six months post-follow-up, uh, which again shows, because it's well known that um, males often, when it comes to health-seeking behaviors, they're quite hesitant. Uh, but I honestly think that it's mainly because of uh, compensation that uh, some of them came back. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any, anyone else from the audience, please? Uh, if not, I will uh, attempt to ask a question. I hope I'm not going off tangent a bit too much. Uh, but I'm wondering what's the impact on, say, the exposure to uh, the barrier functions when they are exposed to the female, uh, female genitalia? Are they, for example, in terms of preventing infection or transmission, is there an implication there as well when exposed to the female counterpart, uh, female genitalia? I mean, I, I wouldn't speak on barrier function specifically, but um, we know that um, when the male penis is inserted into the female vaginal tract, there's exposure of uh, genital fluids, which would then affect uh, inflammation of the, both the, you know, the tissues, both the penile, um, uh, different anatomical size. And, but also there's the mechanical uh, pressure on the penis itself, so that could also kind of disrupt the integrity of the skin there, but that's all hypothetical. I see, I yeah. see. Interesting. Uh, do we have more questions from uh, both our online audience and our physical audience here? Ah, uh, yes, please. Yeah. Hello. No, I was just wondering what the, the future plans or directions of the. I mean, I, I still have, um, today I just presented an aspect of the, uh, the data, but we've done a lot of, uh, we've done RNA extraction, so we've done sequencing, so we're still going to look at um, the changes in uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines. We've done digital spatial profiling, uh, where we looked at how uh, the presence of STIs affects um, the different expression of um, of, of pro-inflammatory cytokines on specific regions in the foreskin. And I think once, you know, we have all that uh, put together, that will kind of uh, tell us where to go moving forward. But um, the plan is to then look at the key markers that are affected by asymptomatic STIs and uh, try and do ex vivo infection models to see um, at an infection model level um, how is infection really affected following, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, but following on to the future directions, uh, you mentioned at the end, for example, developing gels for, for further treatment uh, preventions. Uh, is there any specific properties of these gels? I'm, com I'm coming from a materials point of view. Uh, what kind of properties are we looking for in these uh, gels? To be honest, I, I haven't thought about it uh, to that extent in terms of the properties of the gel. I just know, I think the interest would be, what are you targeting? And then I guess we'd have to have uh, more research and collaboration with, um, um, I guess, material scientists yeah. as well to then figure out, based on the properties of the actual uh, genital tract yeah. and the pH levels and all those other contributing factors to see. But essentially, the interest is to firstly identify what exactly you'd like to target with the gels, of which in this case, I guess we can suggest that looking at tight junction proteins would be something that's uh, useful, seeing that we've seen that there's a significant change following circumcision, which could be one of many mechanisms that could be explaining this observed um, uh, reduction in HIV infection risk following circumcision. All right, thank you, thank you. That's very good. Um, and uh, we've got one um, online uh, question. Uh, I hope it's showing up on the screen here. Uh, what is the magnitude of contribution of barrier function in increasing the susceptibility of, uh, to HIV compared to other risk factors such as M2M, sexual hygiene, and so on? I don't think I can confidently um, honestly say one has more magnitude compared to the other. The only level I can comment to at this point is that we found that barrier function is one of the mechanisms that contributes to susceptibility. And of course, things like sexual hygiene, we did take history um, when we did our barrier function make, uh, make, um, 
our barrier function readings to put that into account. And we know that with men to men, men, -to -men uh, sexual transmission, the commonest uh, way of acquiring the infection is by rectal uh, exposure. So the epithelial layer lining the rectum is way more susceptible uh, to HIV infections compared to the genital tract. So that's a different conversation on its own because the structure is different, but the susceptibility level is way more higher in the in men to men uh, exposure because of the, the, the lining of the rectum. I see, I learned a lot of new things today. <laughs> uh, due to uh, time constraints, let's see if we have one last question. Oh, yes, please. Yeah. Great presentation. Uh, my name is Oliver from Australia. My question is about compliance and accessibility of potential therapies. So your research has potential implications on development of new therapies and treatments for people with HIV. So what are your thoughts on how that would actually be implemented so that people have access to those therapies? I think that um, especially now, there's a lot more hesitancy towards circumcision compared to when it was introduced, especially in developed countries, but even more now increasingly in developing countries. So I think that in itself, coming up with non-invasive alternative preventative strategies would be probably encouraging to a lot of people. and. I mean, in terms of access, to be honest, I mean, we've had, I think we, we, you were here yesterday when we spoke about many factors contributing to access, and that would have to be on a policy level, uh, what local government would be um, willing to provide freely for the, for the locals and socioeconomic factors. So I think it's very complex, um, but yeah. Okay, all right, thank you. Maybe, oh yes, please, yeah. Uh, one, maybe one final question. Uh, I, to talk. I was wondering, uh, in terms of circumcision, is there like one circumcision for uh, all the participants or are there like several types of different circumcision and if that might influence the results? Well, I wouldn't say type. Well, in terms of types, it would be medical and traditional because we have done a study in you know uh, Papua New Guinea uh, populations actually where we looked at the impact of traditional circumcision on barrier function. I just didn't discuss the data here, but it also kind of has the same impact on barrier function. But in terms of medical circumcision, the only differentiation is the technique that's involved, you know, there's a dorsal slit uh, circumcision, but essentially it does the same thing. It removes the foreskin tissue and the healing would be the same. So I don't think uh, that would affect, you know, the, the uh, effects unless if you don't remove completely the entire foreskin, then of course you still have a piece of tissue that's still highly susceptible to being infected. Thank you. I know you've been standing there, maybe just a quick one. <laughs> uh, uh, no, just a quick one, yeah. Okay, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question is that uh, normal HIV and other STT has like a bidirectional impact, synergetic impact. So can we generalize for other, other STT infection because we focus this on HIV? Can we generalize the better impact for other uh, STT infection? This is my one question. The other question is that there may be the level of hydration may be very based on it. Maybe the level of hydration because the water content of human beings differ based on the age. So how just have you assessed based on the age, maybe adolescent, young, it's like, like, thank you. Um, I didn't hear the first one, did you? I, I didn't oh. as well, could so you repeat? Because you quickly. focused on HIV, so can we generalize for other STK infections, yeah? Oh, you mean in terms of um, the improvement in, in barrier function affecting the other um, infections? Yeah. Um, I don't think I can confidently say that because they have different mechanisms to uh, infecting the different anatomical sites of the penis. Um, what I can say is that they influence each other in terms of increasing each other's susceptibility, but in terms of what decreases susceptibility in HIV, I can't confidently say it decreases with other STIs. Yeah. And with the water content and age, uh, it's a good question because when we did our data analysis, we did try to see if maybe uh, there was a correlation between the age and the barrier function readings, but with our cohort, there wasn't really any significant um, correlation. But that definitely maybe contributes to, could contribute to the time it takes for one to um, have the changes that we see uh, based on age.
Thank you. Due to time constraint, I'll have to wrap this up. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, uh, Rometsi, for the very interesting talk and discussion with us. Thank you. Yeah. So next, we will welcome our second speaker of the Young Scientist presentation, Dr. Siu Jianjing, from, uh, who, who's, doing a, who's doing a postdoc research fellowship at uh, the Academia Sinica in Taiwan. So he's doing a neuroscience, and he will bring us through quite a different human organ now, the brain now, um, and talk about microglia and sugar-binding proteins in neurodegenerative diseases like Huntington's disease. Please, Dr. Siu. Good morning. My name is Siu Jian Jin, and I work in Academia Sinica, Taiwan, as a postdoctorate researcher. And today is truly my honor to present you my story about microglia and a sugar binding protein in neurodegenerative disease. So, I have been working with the neurodegenerative disease, such as Huntington disease, that suffer from this kind of movement disorder, as well as tauopathies, such as Alzheimer's disease, that suffer from this memory impairment. And up until now, there's still no effective treatment that is currently available. So, talk about the brain. Inside of the brain, there are four different types of major cells, which include the neuron, the oligodendrocyte, astrocyte, and the microglia. And in neurodegenerative disease, there will be like degenerations of this neuron and the activations of other types of glial cells, and particularly this microglia. So, what is a microglia? Put it to the simple word, microglia is the immune cell of the brain. And let's look at these pictures. Don't, don't be afraid about this. Look at this one. This red color is a marker for microglia. So, whenever you see these red colors indicate, those are the microglia cells. And here, you got this R62. This is the model for Huntington disease. And like Professor Tim Hunt said to yesterday that as a biologist, we like control, right? So with this R62, this is the disease model. Then we have this wild type. Wild type is the control. Means that these are the healthy mice at the same age. So as compared to the wild type, you see this R62 microglia, they have these green signals, which call this galactin tree. So this galactin tree is the sugar binding protein that we mentioned. They particularly like this beta galactoside sugars. So, interestingly, in the normal or healthy brain, the level of galactin-3 is very low or just absent. However, in Huntington disease, this protein is being upregulated and is also a sign for the microglia activations. So, if we look further into this microglia, we found that a portion of galactin-3, actually, this red signal this, now the red signal is the galactin tree. They are actually colocalized with lysosomes. So you can see here, inside of these lysosome structures, some of them, they have this galactin tree pangta. So what it does that is that we found the accumulations of galactin tree in this damaged lysosome, they actually interfere with the clearance of these damaged lysosomes. And the implication of this is that it caused the this regulated inflammatory response contributed by the microglia. And interestingly, if we inhibit galactin-3, no matter by genetic suppressions or pharmacological tools, we can effectively promote the clearance of the damaged lysosomes. And this eventually reduces the inflammatory response triggered by the microglia. These are just the cells and the mouse model we have been using to prove these concepts. So, now it's still at the cells level. How about in the mouse model levels? Remember just now, we look at the Huntington disease patient, they have this movement disorder. So here, this is the assay called, an assay called Rotarod. It can be used to measure the movement capability of the animals. So this one is the R62 mouse model, means the one with the Huntington disease. So you can see here, now it's the movement. Compared to the one with the galactin-3 inhibition treatments, you can see that it performs significantly better compared to this mouse, which is the Huntington disease mouse model. So from here, we can chart the result and found that galactin-3 inhibitions significantly improve the motor functions 
the movement of this mouse model. We have completed this study and get it published. So for the further detail, details, you can look at that. And next, we actually move on to the second part, which is the tauropathy, such as Alzheimer's disease. So when we talk about Alzheimer's disease, it's like there are two hallmark proteins, including the hyperphosphorylated tau, as well as the amyloid beta plug. And interestingly, in both the hyperphosphorylated tau and the amyloid beta plug conditions, we get to see that there are significant upregulated signals of this galactin tree, the green color. So you can see here, when the green and the red, they appear together, they will show as a red color. And let's go back. One thing is uh, interesting is that if you look at here, this white or gray color signals, those are the disease-associated protein. And one interesting observation we found that is that galactin 3 positive microglia, they only appear closer to those abnormal pro disease-associated proteins. So if you compare the microglia here and the microglia here, they might have different properties. And the cutting edge here is that we use the single cells RNA sequencing so that we can compare the property of these cells to the property of these cells. So with that, we use this mouse model and after the brain dissociation, we collected the microglial cells and subjected them to the single cell RNA sequencing. And here, we are managed to identify 12 clusters of microglia. And from here, we can compare the microglia with or without the galactin-3 expressions. And here, we managed to identify those specific genes that are dysregulated in this galactin-3 associated microglia, or we call them the game genes. And what interesting about this game gene is that a lot of genes being implicated here are actually the gene associated with Alzheimer's disease which further proving that this galactin-3 associated microglia plays an important role in Alzheimer's disease. So from here, we can perform the biological analysis using the gene ontologies, so we can predict what kind of functions being regulated by this gene. And here, these are the major biological processes regulated by game gene, including the inflammation, immune system, translation and ribosome, chemotaxis, protein folding, ATP, and apoptosis. Now we know that in this galactin-3 associated microglia or the game gene, the microglia has upregulated of these kind of functions. So how would it do if we remove galactin-3 from the Alzheimer's disease, the tauropathy mice? From here, we cross this tauropathy mice with the mice without galactin-3 and we can obtain the tauropathy mice without galactin-3, and here we perform bio chemical, biochemical assay as well as behavior study, which include this learning and memory assay, and by using this water, Morris water maze. So what is a Morris water maze? It's the nature of the mice that they dislike water. So if you put a mouse into the tank filled with water, they will try to escape. And for the wild-type mice, after a certain period of training, they will remember there's a platform here. So the mice will locate this platform and stand here because they dislike water. So now, the next, I will show you the recording on how the mice will move in the wild-type conditions. And this video is fast-forward. So this is the trail by the mouse. They will swim and they locate this platform. So after training, they remember here is the platform. Next, we look at those with the Alzheimer's disease and Alzheimer's disease without the galactin-3. Again, let's look at the trail. You can see that mice with galactin-3 removal, they remember where's the trail and they can locate the platform. But this one is still finding them. They thought Maybe he thought he remembered the platform. He either remember wrongly or he doesn't remember at all. He's still finding where is the platform. So with that, we can record this trail and then perform analysis. So from here, you can see that this black and the blue line means the wild type, the control mice, and this red color indicates the tarpati mice. They use significantly more time to locate where is the platform, while the 
Tarapati mice without galactin-3, they can locate the platform much faster, means they remember. We can say that galactin-3 inhibitions prevents the learning and memory impairment in Tarapati's. And for translation purpose, we also use this human IPS-derived microglia. And from here, we treated the cells with or without the hyperphosphorated tau, the, the disease-associated protein in Tarapati's, and then also with or without galactin-3 inhibitions. And then from here, after the RNA sequencing, we managed to identify what we call this galactin-3 associated microglia early responsive gene, or we call that the gamer's genes. And it is also very excited to see that a lot of this gamer gene also being implicated in Alzheimer's disease. So for functional validation of this gamer, we treated the condition medium collected from the cells to the tau body neurons and we assay how it will affect the misfolded tau. And from here you can see, indeed with the galactin-3 inhibitions, the pathogenic tau, the misfolded tau, show a decreased levels. So from here we can really say that if we can in suppress galactin-3, it will actually reduce the level of misfolded tau. And if we go further into what happened in the condition medium, this one, I'm not going into the, all the details, but we can conclude to say that inside of the condition medium, there are more exosomes. And these exosomes are actually filled with a lot of disease-associated protein and galactin-3. So I will just go with this schematic diagram to, expand, to explain the mechanisms. In the tau body conditions, the hyperphosphorated tau released by the neurons they will activate the microglia, become the galactin-3 associated microglia. And under such conditions, this microglia release a lot of abnormal exosomes. This exosome is just like a, a letter that can pass from one cell to the other cells. So at the recipient cells, when it receives this abnormal exosome, it will further escalate the disease condition in these recipient cells. And if we can suppress the level of galactin-3 on the microglia side, we can actually reduce and correct these exosomes and then such that when the recipient cells receive this abnormal exosome, it don't have the increased level of the misfolded tau. Of course, we also show that there are regulations of the free form of galactin-3 and pro-inflammatory cytokines, but it's not being included in these studies. And then, we further moved in into this part and found that another property of galactin-3 that contributed to the misfolded tau. We, under the normal conditions, the pathogenic tau, they will accumulate and become a lot of this misfolded tau. But in the presence of galactin-3, it can act like a molecular glue to promote the oligomerization of this pathogenic tau and resulted even more misfolded tau. So, to that brings to my summaries. The accumulations of galactin-3 and damaged lysosomes interfere with the clearance of damaged lysosomes. And galactin-3 promotes the production of exosomes filled with disease-associated protein. And binding of galactin-3 with the pathogenic tau enhances the oligomerization of this pathogenic tau. Inhibitions of galactin-3 may serve as a new strategy for therapeutic intervention in neurodegenerative disease. And with that, I would like to thank all the people that have contributed to this project, and particularly Dr. Yi Zhang Chen, my supervisor, who has guided me throughout the years. Thank you, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Xu. Now, Dr. Yang will be moderating the Q&A session as well. Thank you, Dr. Xu. That was a very interesting talk. All right, uh, any questions from the floor after we've heard about how we can target uh, GAL3 uh, towards uh, neurological disease? Uh, yes, please. Yes. Hi, uh, a very nice talk. Uh, so I was just wondering, I have a very short like, technical question. So I was just wondering, like, I'm not sure if I missed it, but what's the direct mechanism through which galactin has its function? Because uh, you, in your IPSC model, you did a RNA seq after, like, in presence or absence, like inhibiting galactin, but it's like a sugar binding protein. So the direct effect probably comes from, like, like adhesion or some other type of uh, mechanism, not 
through transcription, presumably, right? So transcription would probably be a much more downstream effect, right? So the target genes you're looking at, it's, uh, so just wondering if you could draw a more direct mechanistic link. Is that, does that make sense? Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. This is actually a very important question. Galactin-3 has multiple functions. It has been studied about 30 years ago. And when people start to look at Galactin-3, they notice it is involved in the macrophage activations. So the other name of Galactin-3, if you search through from the literature, is actually called the MAC2, the macrophage activating factors. However, besides of the activations of macrophage, and inflammatory response regulations. In the recent years, people start to notice another very special functions of galactin-3 in which they bind this sh abnormal uh, sugar on the vesicle. So inside of any type of intracellular vesicles, supposedly the sugar is on the intravesicular side. However, when there's any damage, let's say a leak of, of the sugars, it will get exposed, and galactin-3 can recognize this type of sugar and become the pangta like we showed just now. So this is something new and totally different concept. And from here, as you described just now, that you noticed, that you noticed from the single-cell RNA sequencing that we see that galactin-3 involved in a lot of inflammatory response like uh, an immune system. Those are like what we really already know, then what we really found in the different way is that it also inhibit, when we bind with the sugars, it also inhibit the clearance of these damaged vesicles. These are something totally different. And on the second part, when we see that this galactin-3, they also can bind on those misfolded protein. And when they bind with this misfolded protein, they kind of like aggregate them. This protein by itself, they have the property to aggregate, but if we add galactin-3, they even further aggregate. So these are all like the disease condition in the Alzheimer's disease. Thank you for the questions. Wait, wait, I, have, I, had, I did have another question. This is just out of curiosity, like, um, just to, like just out of interest in glycobiology. So like most of the disease uh, phenotypes that's related with sugars, like we often see that there are changes in uh, sugar, so, so like in cancer, like you, uh, you have phenotypes that are associated with changes in sugar molecules. I'm just wondering since galactin is a sugar binding protein, like are there like individuals who might have a different pattern of like expressing different sugars and more susceptible to Alzheimer's? Did you look at that? This question is like, it's still ongoing. <laughs> I have been working on this for like, on the sugar part, the specific pattern, but it's not easy actually. Yeah, it's quite technically <laughs> challenging. That's why I was like, yeah, we often like want to target like these sugar molecules, but there's like, you don't really have anything other than antibodies that can like specifically recognize and we're just... You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think the major obstacle is that even we manage to identify certain type of sugar pattern that happen in the neurodegeneration, even when we say neurodegeneration is a broad term, <laughs> let's say Alzheimer's disease, it's very difficult to at, at the moment to pinpoint the function of this kind of sugar patterns. But I think with the advancement of technology and throughout international collaborations, we, we can get it at least for some clue. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Does, does AI or machine learning help to identify that, or oh, uh, <laughs> don't, it's okay. just a the general thing, question? I, I think the major thing is that currently the data available for the brain glyco is really limited. So I'm still not sure whether with this limited data we can train no, the AI. I see. Yeah. I see. Got it. Thank you. Yes, I know you've been waiting for a while. Thank you. Uh, it was an amazing presentation. And you kind of already uh, talked about a, a few of the future analysis. But I was wondering if you have plans to analyze the effects of this inhibition in other um, hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease as the accumulation of the amyloid peptides and oxidative stress, neurotransmit neurotransmitter reduction. Yeah, that's a great question. We focus on this uh, hyperphosphorated tau, but the other two groups has worked on the amyloid beta part, and they have very similar results as us. Thank you. That's really good. Thank you. Yes, please. Yeah. Really interesting talk. So my question is like uh, amyloid beta. So that is also a protein which uh, aggregates and oligomerizes in Alzheimer's patients. So have you seen galactin-3 uh, interacting with amyloid beta? 
or uh, increasing the aggregation propensity of A beta? For the amyloid beta part, it's quite, quite straightforward because the amyloid beta being released by the cells and at the extracellular level, they combine with each other and become the aggregate. So one of the property of galactin 3 besides being recruited into the exosome, they also can be secreted in the free form. So that one is actually the free form direct binding with the extracellular uh, amyloid beta and promote the aggregations. I think uh, galactin 3 interacts Sorry, Can you repeat? So you think uh, galactin-3 interacts with a beta? Yes, that has been shown by the other group. Thank you, thank you. Yes, please. Thank you. What do you think could be the side effects of the, or do you, did you have a side effect in the wild-type knockout mice? Yeah, that's the beauty of about this work, because in the normal mice or healthy mice or young mice, you don't see galactin-3 in the brain. Only when we start to age or we have neurodegenerative disease or we actually bang our head, then the galactin-3 start to express on microglia. So from what we can observe or from the behavior analysis that we run, we do not see any side effect of galactin-3 inhibitions. Thank you. Any more questions? If not, may I ask a very general one? So it doesn't mean it's not uh, preventive, but it will actually uh, slow down the progression of the diseases rather than preventing it from happening at all. I would say it's more on slowing down. And if we, for translation and the medical purpose, I believe it has to be combined with other drugs. Yeah. See, I see. Then is it a matter of uh, reducing the symptoms as well uh, in, in targeting GAL3? Gal yeah, oh, right. definitely. Right. Thank you, thank you. Any more last questions? Do, uh, if not, uh, due to a time constraint, uh, we will wrap up the session uh, now. And now it's time for certificate giving. Yes. yes, thank you, Dr. Young, and thank you, Dr. Sue. So I would like to present the certificates of appreciation. First to Dr. Sue, please. And can I invite Dr. Rometsi as well? Thank you, everyone. So we've come to the end of the Young Scientist presentations. Um, thank you again for taking the time to prepare that for the fellow participants. And uh, thank you for joining us this morning again, once again to those who just joined us. We will be preparing now for the panel discussion, but before we do that, um, just wanted to take you through some of the housekeeping things we thought we would highlight. So we have, um, we wanted to highlight again our social media hashtags. I think some of you have been posting your pictures and videos and we have been sharing that as well. Thank you very much. We also wanted to highlight the Give Me platform. If you're not already aware, on the back of your badges, um, the, on the lanyards that you're wearing, there's a QR code there that leads to the Give Me virtual platform where our online participants are dialing in from. And if you can log in as well using the login credentials that you see right, now, right on the badge as well. Um, in the platform, on the platform, we actually have a tab called networking. Um, some of you have mentioned that you would like uh, a different way of meeting new people, making new friends. If you go on to the networking tab, there are various topics that we thought might be of interest to you. I'll just read a couple. Energy transition, sustainable energy, cell and molecular biology, cancer. So if you click on that, you can meet fellow like-minded scientists like yourself and, and get to meet new people. The other thing you can do as well is search for participants that maybe you missed out the last name or you only remember the first name and you're trying to get in touch again. So you can do that here and, and um, get in touch with them. There is one more tab we wanted to highlight. I think that would be the Watch Now tab. Oh, sorry, this is the Catch Up tab. So in case you didn't make it for any of the sessions during the GYSS, you can go back on the virtual platform and catch up with some of the lectures and panel discussions that you missed. And I think we have the other tab we wanted to highlight, which is the Watch Now. Um, that's if you're not physically with us here today, if you happen to be just sitting around the SUTD campus somewhere and you still want to tune in, you can just uh, click on the watch now and yeah, you will be watching the live stream of the session. So those are some of the things we wanted to highlight. And now 
I think we can, oh, we're right on time. So we would like to proceed with our next session, the panel discussion on careers beyond academia. The panel today will feature Dr. John Mather, the winner of the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2006, and he will be joining us virtually today. We also have with us uh, Dr. Zhou Li Han, uh, CEO and co-founder of Merexis, which is a Singaporean biotech startup, and Dr. Shi Xu, Shi Xu uh, founder and executive chairman of Nanofilm Technologies International, a leading provider of nanotechnology solutions in Singapore, in Asia, sorry. <laughs> So moderating the panel today, we have um, Dr. Lim Jui, CEO of SG Innovate, a Singapore government agency that supports entrepreneurship centered on the development of deep tech. So please warmly welcome the panel this morning and our moderator as well. And I will now hand the session over to Dr. Lim. Okay, oh, I'm here, all right, thanks. Okay, good morning, fellow young scientists. <laughs> um, first of all, I just want to say how, how uh, privileged I feel to be here. Uh, I did, I ran a panel last year as well. I think this is one of the best things to happen uh, for young scientists all over the world. So really, really happy to be here. Uh, my name is Joey. I'm the CEO of SG Innovate. SG Innovate is a venture capital company at heart but we don't believe that money solves everything. So we're also involved in uh, community building and talent development. Uh, those of you who were in Singapore last week might have seen some of the news around uh, a new platform that we're building that connects talent demand with talent supply, so jobs, as well as training demand and training supply. So we're going to try to aggregate training providers across Singapore, uh, so that anyone who wants to learn to upskill, reskill, uh, has the ability to do so. Yeah. So today's discussion on non-academic career pathways for scientists is uh, totally up our alley, um, um, and and there's something we believe in because um, employment, as we have known it has been changed uh, irrevocably, right? I mean, I think I, I read in today's newspapers, Microsoft is about to lay off 10,000 people. The notion that there is such a thing as an iron rice bowl to borrow from a Chinese idiom uh, is, is no longer true. Um, and that, that creates some very interesting, uh, uh, you know, the, the consequences of that are quite interesting, right? Because it means that things that we had previously considered to be risky, such as entrepreneurship or taking non-traditional paths, suddenly become less risky. Um, so, but don't, don't take it from me. Uh, we have assembled a great cast today. Um, and uh, just because science was your first career step, you don't necessarily have to take a traditional route. Um, so joining us today, hi John, by the way, I didn't, I didn't get a chance to say hello to you earlier. Um, but joining us today, we have Dr. John Mather, who's the you can see him on the screen, who's joining us uh, from California, I believe. John? No, Maryland, actually. Sorry, Maryland? Yes. Oh, dear. So it's quite late for you. <laughs> um, it's fine. So, so John is Senior Astrophysicist and Goddard Fellow with the Observational Cosmology Laboratory at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Dr. Mather is an extremely accomplished scientist uh, and he leads the research on the James Webb Space Telescope, which was launched on Christmas Day in 2021. Uh, a few months ago, I was in Berlin at the Falling Walls Conference and I had the pleasure of listening to a presentation on the James Webb Telescope uh, by, by one of John's colleagues. And I'll just say this, it made my hair stand, right? It, it detects light that was emitted millions of years ago in an effort to understand how how the universe was, uh, was, was you know, the, the origins of the universe. Uh, consequently, he is the recipient of the Nobel Prize in Physics for his work around the Big Bang Theory. Um, immediately on my right is uh, Dr. Xie Xi, who is the founder of Nanofilm Technologies. Uh, this was uh, spun out of the Nanyang Technological University in 1999. 
Today, nanofilm supplies materials that exist on the majority of your handphones, unbeknownst to you. Right? So very, very, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, almost a very ubiquitous uh, technology in, uh, in, 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 in handphones. Um, and nanofilm is one of Singapore's uh, deep tech unicorns. And finally, on my far right, we have the CEO of uh, Meraxis, Dr. Zhou Li Han. Uh, Meraxis is one of the fastest growing biotech companies in Singapore. Um, it uses microRNA to develop early detection kits for cancer. Today, his 350 strong team uh, works across labs and facilities in Singapore, the US, China, and Japan. So, I have a ton of questions for, for my panelists, but this session is not about me, it's about you guys. So I, I, I expect that there will be a lot of questions. Please ask questions. Uh, we also have a virtual audience. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take three questions from, from you guys, and then I'm going to take three online. Uh, for our online uh, uh, audience, just so that we can cover as many topics as possible, if someone is asking a question that's identical or similar to yours, perhaps just vote for it instead of um, asking the question separately. And um, so if, if that's okay with you guys, I'll get started. And I thought I'd start with you, Lee Han. Yeah? Um, because you're probably closest to, to our audience. You're the youngest. Um, Lee Han, tell us, why is it important for young PhDs to consider careers beyond academia? What's in it for them? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, not that young anymore, uh, <laughs> hitting 40 this year. And uh, been in this, um, this journey of starting a company uh, since about 10 years ago. And, and, and the first thing I would say is, um, there seems to be this notion that the moment you get into a non-academic environment, you're no longer advancing science, which is absolutely wrong, right? We did not spin off the company thinking, hey, this is how much we're gonna make, and this is the amount of product we're gonna sell. No, never. We spun out of ASTAR uh, in 2014, and before that, uh, in 2010, we so-called crossed uh, from AUS to ASTAR. Uh, uh, people call that cross to the dark side because ASTAR had more money, right? Uh, which is quite for our global audience, A star stands for the Agency for Science, Technology, and Research. It's it's the equivalent of NSF and NIH, for instance. Yeah. But, Thank you, Trey. So, our step from the university in the first ten years of doing basic research of understanding what RNA is, what microRNA is, what PCR technology was about, way before COVID, and moving to A star, which is really focused a lot more on translation of the technology and to spin off the company is the natural step in taking an innovation and discovery to impact. So I would say even today, you know, we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't quite ask the question what, you know, who we are as, as entrepreneurs or technopreneurs. You know, we ask, have we delivered impact? Have we taken the science that was developed to reach the impact, which is why we are in science in the first place. Right? So I don't truly think uh, there is a huge differentiation in terms of doing good science in an academic environment versus doing that in a translational uh, startup environment. The goal is still the same. But I have to say that the day-to-day -day focus is, can be quite different. And, and we can be quite tough in terms of what project works, what project doesn't work. Sometimes, yes, a hypothesis failed, and, and, and we restart that in the university, but in the company, if that, especially in the bad economic environment like now, certain pipelines get canned, certain pipelines get chopped, because we just have to focus in delivering something that will reach impact faster. And money and, and revenue or profit will come if we deliver impact. But if you look at the dollar sign, I would say, you know, that's not the best way of of reaching that impact in developing science. But nevertheless, I think when you join a startup, unless you're one of the lucky few who joins an incredibly well-funded startup, I mean, did that, you know, very often 
you have funding for a limited runway. Uh, and that's very different from working in a big company or in academia where you, you know, you can, there's visibility. It's a longer horizon. So how did that affect your decision? Or, or you, were, you, know, you were so convinced that this was going to change the world, it, didn't, it, it was not even material? So I've never um, attended any business school courses before I spun off. And that's probably the core reason why we just went ahead. Right. Uh, and ASTAR, I have to thank ASTAR that did a wonderful job because for the four years that we were with ASTAR, uh, we essentially got a yearly contract. You hit your milestones, you get a contract renewed. You hit your milestones, you get a contract renewed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which kind of positioned the mindset instead of, oh, you know, I've got five years to finish my PhD or seven years to finish a PhD, or in a big company, we got 10 years to do a project. Essentially is proof that what you claim, prove your hypothesis is true, and prove that it makes impact, right? however small that may be. So with clear milestone, you know, what we are thinking of at that point is not, okay, what Morexis will be in three years, five years, or seven years, but in that journey of bring a RNA technology to become a cancer early detection blood test, right? there were four milestones. Do we have the right biomarker? Can we make it into a kit? Can we manufacture that? And can we go to a clinical trial? Essentially, the four milestones. And we were focusing on hitting that milestone. And each of these were a year, two years away. And of course, we have to raise money along the way. But the moment, but if the impact is clear, the market is clear, by hitting milestones, it's actually not difficult, especially at the later stage to raise money. But I have to say, uh, 10 years ago, and, and, and Trey knows this a lot better than, than I do, um, when we spun off, I had to do 600 pitches to get the first dose of money. So, so it wasn't easy. And on this island at that point, there were less than 10 VCs that were even entertaining a meeting with someone that talks about RNA and PCR. Right? But along the way in the last 10 years, it, the ecosystem, and, and Trey mentioned in his introduction, it's really not about the money. You've got the right technology, the right purpose. If the ecosystem is growing, if you can find the good people, money will come and impact will be made. Thanks, Lee Han. Um, I'm going to move on to John. Um, John, it's such an honor once again uh, to have you at our discussion today. Um, John, could you just tell us a little bit about the path you took from university and how you ended up uh, at NASA? Yeah, sure. Um, I went to graduate school at University of California in Berkeley. Um, thinking that I wanted to be a theoretical physicist like Richard Feynman, who's such a hero to so many young scientists. And um, I was there and I'm thinking, well, this is very, very difficult. I asked my advisors, uh, should I do this? And they said, no, um, there is no funding for um, th theoretical physicists. All those jobs are taken. So I started asking faculty, what should I work on? And I found uh, some people who were going to try to measure the cosmic microwave background radiation. So I said, that sounds interesting. I'd like to work with you. And so um, we, we started. And so uh, we made one successful measurement from the mountaintop in California. And then we built a balloon payload um, to measure the spectrum of the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is the remnant of the early universe. And so <clears throat> I wrote a thesis about that. But the first flight of that equipment failed. So I had to write a thesis about a non-functioning payload. <clears throat> Okay, well, I was very fortunate that my thesis committee and thesis advisor said that's good enough. So I got a job at the NASA laboratory in New York City. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, this work I've been doing is too difficult, so I'm going to try switching to another subject. So I said, I'm going to become a radio astronomer, uh, <laughs> which is different. Anyway, uh, I had been there about six months when NASA called for proposals for new scientific missions. I thought, okay, well, I only know one thing, but I'll say um, we should try this. So I said to my boss, um, well, my thesis project failed, but we should try it in outer space. So we wrote a proposal and we sent it in and that became the Cosmic Background Explorer satellite that did measure the Big Bang and uh, sent us off to Stockholm. So that's how it got in. Um, and it was a big surprise. It was not a plan. Uh, it was just saying yes to opportunity. And but John, at the point... Done, then I yeah. Sorry, just a quick one. At the point when you left Berkeley for New York, though, um, 
what was the thinking process? Was it just because there was no funding, no further funding at Berkeley, so you, you had no choice? No. Or, or you, no, you, you went there clearly that you didn't want to, you didn't want to stay in academia, you didn't want to stay at, to be a no, professor? No, that's much simpler. I got a job offer. Okay. I got a phone call from uh, NASA, would you like to work with me? So I said yes. So um, anyway, then um, we did that, build that project. I moved down to the big science laboratory in Maryland, where I am now. Um, and then um, when that was done, uh, then I said, what do I do now? Uh, and I got a phone call, another phone call from unexpected, would you like to work on this new telescope, which is what I've been doing ever since. So my career has not been about detailed planning or a particular persistence. It's been about saying that yes to opportunity. Thank you, John. John, I think the audience would love to hear a little bit about the James Webb Telescope. If you could just indulge us. Yes, sure. Yeah, it is a uh, six and a half meter diameter telescope. It is in outer space now, 1.5 million kilometers away from us. And it is cooled down to a low temperature of about 50 Kelvin so that it can observe infrared light from the many sources in the distant universe, ranging from uh, the most distant objects we can see, the first galaxies and stars that grew from the Big Bang material, to uh, stars being born inside dust clouds, to even planets around other stars. So it uh, took 27 years to build it after I got that phone call. And uh, now it's up there and working perfectly with uh, beautiful pictures every week. Incredible, incredible. Um, but as you look back over your very long and distinguished career, is there anything you would have done differently, knowing what you know today? Or this has just been an... Yeah, an... yeah um, I was very cautious and shy, and I did not ask people for help along the way. Mm. And I think it would have been very interesting and uh, productive to say, oh, well, I have this idea, can you help me with it? Uh, but I, I didn't do that. I guess I can't argue with success, but I think it would have been more fun to talk to more people, uh -huh. um, to just say, well, what are you doing? Uh, I've got an idea. And um, that would, I, I recommend that to young people. So I was lucky, but it, I think it's even better to be active. Thank you. And, 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 and what were some of, I mean, you've had so many incredible achievements, but what would you rank as? the two or three greatest milestones? And uh, you know, how, how do you think they've shaped your worldview as a scientist? Well, I think my milestones relate, that, that I can take personal credit for are relating to creating the Cosmic Background Explorer, the COBE satellite mm -hmm. mission, because that was my idea. Uh, and I had a, a particular technical concept that we did actually build. So I really am proud of that. And uh, we did not know what we would find. So it was, we were very fortunate that uh, the universe yielded up some secrets mm -hmm. uh, that were worth a prize. So you, sometimes you build something and nothing happens. Uh, but we were fortunate uh, that there was something to find. Do you, think, do you think your colleagues who stayed in academia, I mean, if, if you had stayed in academia, would you have been able to do the same thing? I don't think so. Yeah, um, and that's principally because NASA of NASA. Has of, NASA has resources of engineering teams and uh, and um, and support systems that enable these large projects to be built. Mm -hmm. And if you're at a university, you do not have access to that directly. Mm -hmm. um, uh, although you can propose to get such help. So if I had been at a university, I could have written the same proposal, and we would have found a way. Um, but personally, I think uh, um, I really like very difficult, large projects, and it's a pleasure to work with these great teams. And that's harder to do in universities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, John. I'm going to move on now to Professor Xuxi. OK, Lee Han talked about how difficult it was in 2010. But you were even crazier. You left in 1999. You, are, you were already an established professor at Nanyang Technological University. So, Prof, take us through. What happened? <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much for having me here. Yes, uh, I would think my path to, towards the commercialization and the entrepreneurship 
was quite unique, not conventional. For example, as a nutshell for example, I failed to raise any fund before I start up the company. Did you fail or did you choose not to? <laughs> <laughs> Actually failed, really. <laughs> yeah, the interesting thing is I was in the vacuum coating line and the vacuum coating technology field, understand that is a very slow moving uh, field. Over decades, uh, mostly the changes are engineering. Okay, engineering refinement, machinery refinement, but there is hardly any fundamental uh, shift breakthrough mm -hmm. in coating industry. So I had a long term of uh, research work, uh, collaborating with uh, overseas uh, colleagues, uh, Cambridge and Sydney, and even USA also, some companies we work together. And we had some interesting uh, discoveries and, and breakthroughs. And especially in Singapore, I led a team and uh, found a few patterns and solved a, quite a few uh, fundamental issues. So we put a particular coding technologies into a commercial path. But then it, is, it was a very new thing and it was not proven and uh, it was difficult to actually to get recognized, mm -hmm. accepted by the market. Mm -hmm. It's very deep, so we're talking about deep tech. It is, uh, it's really deep. Once you are really deep, you, 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 you don't have the tunnel to, to reach the ground. So uh, after a couple of years of um, many, many attempts, and uh, we, um, actually had it nowhere. We couldn't get people uh, putting money to start a company. And, but then the interesting thing is that we did a lot of samples to all uh, the world, the companies. And, and the one company uh, and tested the sample and I found that this is exactly what they want for the next generation product. Mm -hmm. That uh, was Hitachi, Japan. So uh, after very intensive evaluation and so on, so they, uh, you know, I don't know why, they just issued a PO, but they didn't know whom to address to. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, no, I mean, in the university, in the laboratory, I, I couldn't accept your PO, mm -hmm. no way. So we, we found a local uh, Japanese company too to act as an agent. So they accept the PO, then again, they don't know this PO transfer to where. <laughs> so, so eventually the university would think that that's something that, you know, we have to think about actual commercial now. It's no longer just talking and, and uh, uh, talking and flowing around. So we, we need, really need to do something. So at, at the time also, uh, for me, Another interesting thing is I never had any commercial experiences. I didn't know anything about running a company. I, I didn't actually plan to leave university at all. But at the end, you know, this is something you, 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 see, you feel so happy that your technology was required, was recognized, and, and, and about to be used in real world, right? Mm -hmm. so, so that is kind of an impulsion. And it just pushed me and, and come out to, to do something. And as I said, that this is a, entirely a accidental event, <laughs> entirely unplanned. And, and uh, we didn't have any capital to start, but yeah, we had a PO though. Mm -hmm. So we had an advance payment from the customer. So it's a very different path. And from beginning until now, we never in red. It's always, we were always making money. And although struggle for a long time, but we went through. But was it scary? I imagine it must be quite scary. I mean, you know, you're not gonna have the same yes. salary anymore. Yes. Uh, there's uncertainty. <laughs> yes. Um, 
you know, you left a tenured position. Yeah. This is... Uh, I think, uh, you know, it it's really depends on uh, individual aspiration. Mm -hmm. uh, I was, since I was a kid, I, I really liked doing things. Roll up the sleeves, you know, make some mechanical stuff. It's typically electronic mechanics is really something I love. And so it's, it's very individual. I would say uh, academic life uh, as a researcher is a wonderful life. It's a wonderful career. And, and uh, you, we can make such impact to the society mm -hmm. by new discoveries, by new inventions. But then, if you want to see the commercialization process in front of your eyes yourself, and, and if you want to roll up the sleeves and do something yourself and, and make products and interact with the world right, and to sell your product, offer your product, in real applications. Now, if you are this type of people, you have this kind of impulsion in your, mm -hmm. in your heart, then probably there will be another path to go. Mm -hmm. So now that you've made this decision, so uh, again, it just shows how important serendipity is in, in, in so many ways, uh, and will, uh, the, 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 the desire for self-determination. Having crossed the Rubicon, what were the biggest hurdles? Uh, now that you jumped into the abyss. Yeah. Um. In my case, it's really, I think uh, as an academia, in the past, you, you one just deals with materials, right? Yeah. It's a material world. You, 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 in, you bet yourself, you bury yourself every day in the lab and working, talking to the machines. Uh, and my, I still remember almost 35 years ago, my research supervisor and, and introduced me to some of his friends. Say, he said, oh, this machine is his wife. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's how we do and how we make breakthroughs, right? So you have to bury yourself in, in, in the work to, to really uh, communicate, talk to uh, the objects you are working with, right? Mm -hmm. But then, if you decide to go on to the commercial world, to me is a shock because now you need to deal with another two dimensions. One is the market, and the other everyday people. Mm -hmm. right? Very, very different experiences, very, very different skill sets you need. So how did you bridge this gap? Recognizing that you had no business experience, what did you, did you, yeah, I mean, you yeah. just decided I'll just learn on the job or did you take one or two courses in accounting? Yeah, I think skill sets, sometimes you have to make up, you have to do something to enrich yourself. For example, as, as um, uh, anyone doing business, you must learn to read finance. You must learn to uh, some basic logics of accounting, mm -hmm. right? You, you need to know the corporate structure. Uh, you need to understand people deeply. Right? And you need to understand your customers. And you always strive for win-win situations. Mm -hmm. right? So it's, it's, it's a very uh, long and, and uh, uh, struggling process sometimes. But as I always think, as a, a successful entrepreneur, you, you need to have certain attributes, certain traits. Like you, you must have the passion, definitely. You must have the passion, you must have the vision. Mm -hmm. And not only that, you must have the determination. Right? And then you must have the skill set to execute. Uh, execution, you can't just play lip service. Mm -hmm. You need to actually do things, run operations. Right? You need to cost conscious. Right? You need to drive down the cost and deliver good service and products to customers. And, and you need to be constantly innovative. We, we can't lose our innovation. Right? Although the environment is very different, for example, in the laboratory, in order to write a scientific paper, you do 100 experiments, one successful, verified success, then you can write a paper, probably many papers to follow. But in the industry, 
in order to offer a product, to sell a product at an affordable price to customers, you need to do 100 times and 99 times probably successful. Right? You, you don't have room for mm -hmm. error. Mm -hmm. And you mm -hmm. need to constantly improve your workflow and constantly drive down the cost. And, and uh, one big shock when I left university was that I no longer work on budget. There is no people giving me money. Uh -huh. You have to earn the money yourself, <laughs> right? You have to live on yourself. So I, I'm a very old school. I don't like those economy that basically burn other people's money. I, I think you need to burn your own money. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Li Han, how about you? I mean, you, you mentioned earlier also when you started, you had no experience on the business end of, of things. How did you address those gaps? Every pitch we made, just like Dr. She said, every customer we met was a learning experience. Mm -hmm. so, so I would say in, in initial days, uh, I, I was told, right, the end goal of that pitch is to get money. And after 100, you realize that you have failed 100 times and you've got to change your mindset, otherwise you know, you're going to go into depression. So I said, it's okay. Every pitch is to understand what I've not done well and what, more importantly, what can we improve in terms of the technology, in terms of the product positioning, in terms of even engaging people. Dr. Chi is absolutely right. When we moved into the world of, of commercialization early stage, it's all about understanding why would a pharma company that's based out of the US entertain us? I mean, we're nobody. Right, we're Singapore lab, yeah, we specialize in microRNA, we publish a few good papers, but why would someone based out of the US want to give you that quarter million dollars for the first PO, mm -hmm. right? And it was really for me is, is learn on the job, do it. But I think what I probably did right was be very open to hear what people are telling you, mm -hmm. right or wrong, mm -hmm. right? And we make a decision in terms of what makes sense to us at that point. Okay. So, and, and I think, you know, as PhDs, if you have gone through that training, we didn't go into PhD to learn the subject. We did PhD to learn how to learn. And when we apply that in the real world, that's all it takes, honestly. I mean, you can read a business book, you can read accounting, those are not difficult for scientists because it's all about logic. Mm -hmm. It's just that we have to switch the logic from the material, the cells, into human. And I think that's the most difficult but essential path to cross. Thank you, Lihan. John, I, I, I expect that you don't come under similar profit and loss pressures, uh, but that doesn't mean there aren't any pressures. I mean, what kind of pressures do you face uh, running a program of such, uh, you know, I, I imagine it must be quite expensive but also hugely significant. Yeah. yeah, so I'm actually not the manager who has to manage all those stresses about the budget. Uh, so I work with the managers to make sure that they understand why we're doing what we're doing and what the scientific value is. And um, then uh, other people's job was to go uh, convey the budget to the people who have the money to spend at Congress. So NASA is so large that we specialize in these different parts. So my particular part is to sort of explain and, uh, and show the value of what we're trying to do so that people don't lose sight of the reward at the end of the project uh, while we're thinking about how to get the resources to complete it. Mm -hmm. So um, I've always had a very optimistic view and I think that uh, shows in the world, uh, we built something that was, uh, had no competition. Uh, there's no other way to get the information we were after. And so that was part of my job is to explain all of that to the world uh, so that they could see it. So th then uh, the details of how many people does it take to do something and how long does it take, that's a very different subject and I'm not good at that part. Mm -hmm. So I'm just glad that we do have people who are. So that I, I think that's, 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 that's such an important point because sometimes and I'm sure the both of you will agree, uh, you're not going to cover all the bases. So it's very important to build good teams. Um, John, did you have a chance to pick your team or was this 
uh, kind of provided for by NASA? Well, the team grows organically. When you have a manager uh, and people want to work on your project, people volunteer. They say, can I work on your project? It's so wonderful. And then uh, the managers and the NASA system basically organize the rest. Mm -hmm. So I didn't actually have to do very much about evaluating whether such a person is a good person to be on the team. Mm -hmm. Also, we have a very competitive process with proposals and reviews for all of the commercial partners. So we don't say, I know how, how to build this, uh, build it like this. We say, okay, world, uh, write me a proposal for how you would do this and then show me that you can. Mm -hmm. So then we spend a lot of time at NASA making sure that they are actually able to do that. And so that's how we get to do the nearly impossible. We ask the world, how would you do it? And somebody says, yeah, I can do that. And uh, then we say, prove it. And then we do it. Fun. <laughs> you see, you also mentioned uh, that one of the greatest challenges in, uh, in the private sector was managing people, right? So tell us how you dealt with it. I mean, what is your philosophy when it comes to hiring and then developing them and maintaining them? Yeah, thank you. And, and that from beginning that was a challenge because my team only myself had experiences in vacuum industry i had a, a bit of experiences in, in building machines and, and the process all my engineers they all came from different disciplines they, they could be electronic engineer they could be software engineer mechanical design engineer but none of them actually worked for vacuum equipment so, so we had to uh, spend many hours just go through from the very beginning, the vacuum beginning, how to create vacuum, how to maintain vacuum, how to you know, build the vacuum equipment, what are the important components, one by one, right? Just, uh, and, uh, and uh, to link them with their pre, uh, previous work knowledge. I mean, they are all basically fundamentally linked with basic logics. So it's nothing is isolated. Mm -hmm. right? so, so you need to pave the road for them to learn, as just Yihan said, that we, we need to learn how to learn. Right? And, and uh, to deal with people, I think uh, that is a very important thing. It must come from yourself. You must have a good self-assessment what you are good at, right? And which area you can lead. And you need a team. For example, like sales. I'm not good in sales at all. I don't think I have the character for sales. Uh -huh. right? And I think you know, marketing is a science, and research is a science, but sales is an art. Uh -huh. so, so I don't think I possess that kind of artistic uh -huh. skills. For sales. But then you need people to help. Right? You need a team. And uh, you, you really need a team in HR, finance, right? and, uh -huh. and you need a team for engineering work and to deal with customers, to, to really be friend with customers, know their challenge, know their pain points, and how we can solve. So, so all this need uh, teamwork. Uh -huh. and, and you need to be humble. You need to know that many places you are not as good as your team people, right? We will need to work together, brainstorm, and everything on table. Don't talk anything behind uh -huh. uh, after you leave the meeting room. Uh -huh. So execution, same direction, right? same strategy, same, same mindset. Uh -huh. so, so these are the very, very important. So I think most important for a founder uh, and to start something by yourself single-handedly, we still need to be extremely humble, right? So you, you need to rely on your team member to work together with you. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you need to learn along the way uh, many other uh, good things from your team members. Right? You, but to make things really organized, I think some key skills, very, very important organizational behavior, 
example, right? You need to know how people work in the organization, right? And how people generally behave mm -hmm. in the organization. And you need to know what a company is for. The company is there to make profit, right? To, to make benefit to stakeholders. Right? It's not a yeah, generalized family. Right? It doesn't possess a lot of family attributes. It's, it's there for commercial exploration, to make money, to make profits, and to benefit the stakeholders. So we need to keep focus. Mm -hmm. Now, these are very important learning points. I think, uh, in my experience in, in venture capital, we also see a lot of people who are young CEOs who get so distracted. I mean, it, it is true, fundraising is a big part. Without the money, there's nothing you can do. But then they become so fixated, they forget there is a team back home. And that team needs to be healthy. The relationships need to be maintained and nurtured. So I'm going to stop here uh, because just watching the previous session, there were so many questions. I, I, I want to just give us, because it's really for you, uh, I'm going to give us adequate time uh, for questions from the audience. So I'm going to take the first three from you guys and then I'm going to see if there are any questions online. Um, I see there are two questions. The young man in the green shirt, uh, please... Uh, Introduce yourself and, and fire away. Thanks. Good morning. I'm uh, Patrick Fuchs from University College London. Uh, I'm a postdoc there. And uh, I think many of us postdocs here are looking into the future and uh, seeing a bleak academic prospect <laughs> because there are very few tenure positions. So, uh, I don't know if at this point I would give up a tenure position to leave academia, but um, I think industry is a it's a very real possibility for, for many of us here. Uh -huh. Anyways, it's a, it's a very sharp funnel. I was just wondering, um, maybe this is um, more relevant for the, the venture capital, um, but was there ever a moment um, where, I understand you're more able to make impact in industry, but many of us uh, go into science both because we want to make a change, we want to change the world or have an impact, but also because we're curious. So do you have a feeling that moving to industry has impacted the way you can satisfy your curiosity about uh, subjects that you're working on? Uh, would you, anyone you want to direct this question to or just, shall I open it up? Um, just open up, yeah. Okay, who wants, who wants to take a crack on that? At that? Yeah, maybe have a go first. Please. I think, uh, you know, the, the actual uh, lasting driving force uh, the internal driving force is always, as a scientist, always the curiosity, always the desire to make impact, and the desire to see your technology being put in practical use. And uh, even in a company, I think uh, you, you can do that. But obviously, you need to select the things you do. You must do uh, the area that you are good at, and you, you have your breakthroughs, and you really created something there. Uh, take example, for example. Recently, uh, a year ago, we started a journey on hydrogen economy. Okay? And, and the, I, particularly, I think uh, this is the last leg of my working career. I want to devote most of my time and energy onto that because I see this is, is impactful industry. And, and that comes to our fundamental deep tech research. And for hydrogen fuel cells, you need to solve a series of engineering issues. And it's not a principal problem. Everybody knows how it works. Everybody knows how to make a fuel cell in the lab. But the problem is the cost, efficiency and the cost. So you need to solve a series of engineering issues to make this really commercializable and not based on stipend, uh, those allowances or those projects from the government. You, you have to make this work commercially. But so, there is a trade-off, right? I mean, you, I mean, there is a trade-off. Yeah. You, must, you must contain the curiosity bit because the you, you have to make... the curiosity. Yeah. 
Yeah. You ship the curiosity into like how to make it actually work. Mm -hmm. More towards uh, from fundamentals, gradually, you, you, it actually is a wide, much wider spectrum. As a scientist, always, I, for example, the deep tech, we involved in the deep tech, we created, we invented the coatings for metal BPP, bipolar plates. And, and so far, I think this is definitely the best coating available for metal BPP. So this is the fundamental part, deep tech stuff, all from the laboratory. Mm -hmm. But then you need to refine it, you to need to make it successfully on the plates and need to test it, verify it in the real stack. Right? So this gradually coming towards more engineering issues. But then you still, you need to keep your curiosity. You, you still need to be curious how, make, how to make the whole thing work. Right? And along the way, a lot of fundamental issues you still need to solve. So I think there is no immediate conflict. Mm. And it depends how you divert your energy and your thinking. Mm -hmm. And as long as you are doing, for me, my only experience is towards like deep tech commercialization. So as long as we are doing, stick on deep tech as the anchor, and that a real as wide tunnel as possible to reach the ground, that's the commercialization to reach the ground, provide real products. And, and the whole process will give us such fulfilling mind. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Uh, I believe the young lady uh, in the white shirt uh, is next. Hello. So forgive me if I'm getting the order wrong, but why don't you go ahead? Please introduce yourself. And Uh, my name is Regina Huang from the University of Hong Kong, and I'm thinking of starting my own business after I graduate. So my question is, how do you build an effective relationship, especially how do you find people who share common interests with you? Again, is there someone you want to direct this question to, or it's open to the panel? Open to the panel, thank you. Okay, maybe I'll assign this one to, to Li Han. So your question is, how do you build relationship and find... an effective relationship. Like, I find it kind of difficult, especially you meet a lot of people, but it's hard to maintain a long-term effective relationship with others. Absolutely. Um, so I, th I think through my early days, the one thing, I, I can't remember what changed that, was the shift from caring who we are, what we can do, to what why are we relevant to the person we are talking to? Because as scientists, we, we are so proud of our discovery, we are so proud of the things we do, and we go on and tell people, I'm wonderful, this is a great science, this is gonna change the world. Forget about all that. The question is, so what if you publish a nature paper? So what if you publish a cell paper? How is that relevant to Mr. John on the street? Right? So I find to be a lot easier to communicate and build their report by thinking, why would John even talk to me? Why am I relevant to him or her? So what if we have done great science? Right? We, we talk about impact. But in our mind, at least when I was in University of A-Star, the, the, the impact is a patent, a publication. We go present this at a conference. That's the impact, the immediate impact. But it doesn't translate into the real world. So we have to ask, because give you one example. So we developed these uh, blood-based cancer early detection tests, right, to catch cancer early. Wonderful idea, we go pitch to VCs, nobody will disagree with the idea. But when we go to the real world, we did a free community screening uh, uh, at one of our uh, Singapore district. We screened 242 elderly, 60 to 70. We found two aunties of high risk. And both aunties, when we approached them to take the next step, said, no. I don't want to know. Even if I have cancer, let me die. The other auntie said, you know, I have no money to treat. So thank you for doing this free, green, uh, free screening for me. But, you know, just, just let me go. Right? And then you realized it takes a lot more to achieve the impact, because the impact is to find the cancer early. 
if the two elderly aunties, for whatever reasons, is not willing to take the next step, your 10 years, 20 years of work, of millions and hundreds of millions of dollars into developing that wonderful test is useless. Right? So we have to think about what is the ultimate impact, define that, and define who do we need to work with to achieve the impact, and really understanding that person. So take ourselves out of us as a scientist, and now think, as an everyday person, why am I relevant? Uh, that was a huge uh, awakening for me, and, and I just had a much easier time communicating with people that way. Yeah. But Regina, was it, were the relationships you were referring to, you're talking about relationship with your customers, or relationships with co-founders? How do you find somebody who will start a company with you? How do you build a team? Is that, uh, which relationships? Okay, so, all right, so let's just, you did, did you start the company by yourself or you had a few co-founders? Uh, I was fortunate. Uh, we kind of spun off the whole lab. So, okay. so it was a group of people that we had the relationship and trust over a period of time doing research together. So that was very fortunate, mm -hmm. you know, in mm -hmm. my case. But subsequently, we did have to bring in, you know, new team members and all that. So again, the same principle, I would say, matters. Right? And the first question I ask uh, generally during job interview is, how is Marexis relevant to you? Not the other way. Because I want to understand, what can I do for you? Right? And if this individual's interest aligned with the company's interest, then it's an easy path. Right? So, so again, I apply the same principle to build mm -hmm. trust with my, my customers, to my uh, stakeholders, uh, as well as the team. It's always, like Dr. Shi said, win-win situation. But we have to be very, very honest with each other. Right? Like Tree has you know, alluded mm -hmm. to. If we're not honest with each other, we hide our interests or we hide our concerns, that's not going to work. Yeah. Thank you. I, I'm just going to just take a derivative of that for, uh, and ask the same question to John. John, you were, you were looking at making proposals for some seriously big you know, uh, projects. Surely you, you didn't do this by yourself. I mean, I, I know you had a manager to manage you know, some of the, uh, the budgetary side of things, but as a team though, how did you find your... I imagine you did have a team, for, for, first of all. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we do have teams and we do have process for building teams. And let me suggest that there's a book that was written by a NASA manager about how NASA builds teams. Mm. That's actually the title of the book. Um, and so it points out that we need to recruit to have people of all kinds of different talents mm -hmm. and uh, that we should be in the organization. We should be doing the things that we're capable of and that we like to do because we are, we are not interchangeable. So um, basically, uh, um, in a big organization, you have a pretty wide range of choice of who can you would like to have to work with you. We say, oh, I know this best person that's been doing this before, and I really want that person. Uh, and then, of course, those people are always busy doing something else. So there's a matter of persuasion uh, to say, well, I have this really wonderful thing. Uh, will the organization let that person work with my project? So that's always a very tricky thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's once again, it's called that. How NASA Builds Teams. That's the name of the that's book. The that's actually the name of the book. book. Thanks, John. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the young lady in the gray dress. I, I think you I think you came third. Please, uh, please introduce yourself and, and um, far away. Yeah, my name is Maha, and I'm from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question is about like when do you know that the technology is ready to move like to the commercialization stage because like in lab there's a lot of technology which people develop and it's really you know you get like a perfect result but like when do you know like okay I'm ready now to move on Prof <laughs> yeah that is a very very good question I think uh, many, many young people will encounter this problem that before they start something. And that's why, you know, all the VCs, they have all uh, people assess technology. They do technology due diligence. And it's, but for self, yeah, if you want to start something, 
And you need to have a self-assessment, right? You need to really look at the technology you created, the product you're trying to create from a very neutral position. You need to really look at the uh, uh, how to, uh, at the beginning, you need to really study how to survey the market. So whatever you want to do, address, you try to address which market. What are the market uh, area and, uh, and the people you, you want to target at? Right? And are they real? And, and how many competitors? Uh, how many competing products around? And do you have any uniqueness? I think the most key word is any product you create, you want to sell, do you have any uniqueness? What is that different from all the other products selling on the market? Is it pioneering new product? Or is it just trying to compete and grab market share from other people? Right? So be truthful to yourself. And a lot of niche products you create or niche technology you have made breakthrough it may end up different exit ways, right? And some may be just a good uh, supplement for, for another big corporate, bigger corporation, right? And, and uh, part of attachment to another bigger setup. But some may you really can stand by yourself and you can develop uh, verticals and really to grow a business yourself. But that's, of course, is rarer. It's mm -hmm. more difficult to do that. But, but Maha, I think there's always an element of risk because, you know, there's no formula, unfortunately. Uh, but these are, you know, these are guideposts, but that's all they are. Yeah, I agree yeah. because like also some of like the risk which, me, which we can think of is like, let's say like a technology which is like in life is successful, but what if it's like failed when you're like doing a commercialization or trying like to make it? like to make a part like more accessible to like, let's say, the end users. Um. Yeah. Um, uh, John, John wants to, wants to chip in. Go ahead, John. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I think we've already uh, made it pretty clear that the main thing that's important is what do the customers want more than what do I want? So in order to find that out, uh, again, I would just recommend getting help. Uh, asking people, uh, would you buy this? Uh, and what is the what is the uh, effect that you see in my idea? So making presentations and trying to convince somebody until you really feel that you've got it right is a pretty important thing. Um, if you just say, I know what to do, then you probably don't. Mm -hmm. If you have passed the test of convincing many people, you have a better chance. Yeah, I think that's great advice. Be honest with yourself. Do an honest self-assessment of yourself, your product, and know when to get help. Thank you very much. Reach out. Yeah. Sure, if Thank I may, you. You know, chip in here. I give you one one easy answer to that is: is someone willing to put down money for that? That's true. And, that's and, in, like and for for us, we didn't raise money until two years after we founded the company. But similar to Dr. Shi. Within a week of founding the company, I had a quarter million dollars PO from US. So either a venture capital is willing to put down money to bring your technology to the next step, because in many cases, uh, in order to advance a technology towards commercialization, you can no longer do so in an academic environment for various operational reasons. And secondly is, if a customer is willing to pay actual money to use your technology, Right. So that, that could be a, a validation of, yes, it's mature enough to go to the next step. Now, it doesn't guarantee that you're going to get a second PO or a third PO or fourth PO, or you will actually materialize. But if someone is willing to put money on the table to help you, do it. Thank you. OK, the young man in the light blue shirt. Well, thank you very much. My name is Chuck. Ng. I'm the founder, I'm the co-founder of the World Leading Scientists Institute. We're actually affiliated with both Berkeley and Stanford. Um, so actually, um, John, uh, first question to you uh, is, uh, as, a, as a fellow Berkeley alum, uh, congratulations for your success. Uh, my question to you is, is there like a, 
eureka moment or there are a series of eureka moments for you uh, on, on the things that you did that helped you to win the Nobel Prize. Um, and what's your advice to doing hard science because you actually fail initially? Um, you know, so, so that's the first question for you. And then my question for the panelists uh, is um, what's one single advice you have for these young scientists if they want to start their own company? Thank you. Go ahead, John. Oh my goodness. Yeah, so I, there, the eureka moments for me are when I see that there's an idea that I have that actually solves a problem that other people want solved. So when I saw that I knew how to measure the spectrum of the cosmic background radiation, I knew I had something really important to do. And so I was willing to work on it until we could solve it. Uh, so I think people knew right at the way at the beginning of our COBE satellite that there could be a Nobel Prize in it if it, everything worked. So we knew at the beginning that it was important. So that was the eureka moment at the beginning that it was important. And a similar one happened when we started the new telescope, the Webb telescope, because we knew there was no other way to do that mission besides this gigantic thing that we built. So it's, you're guaranteed to win if you can do the project uh, when you have something so unusual. So that, that was my eureka moment, and, or a couple of them. Of recognizing when you have a really, really unusual idea. John, how, how important was that Nobel Prize? What, was that a real incentive or was it just, you know, no, a nice to have? All. Yeah. It's, uh, I, I don't do things to get a prize. I mm -hmm. do things that I think are important. And I'm happy when somebody else agrees that they're important. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you, John. Uh, panelists, uh, you want to take on Chuck's second question, which is the single single piece of advice, right? Single most important advice. Now. Yeah, <laughs> that would help, you know, like the uh, young scientists, to just, mm -hmm. you know, to start their company because obviously you guys have a lot of industry experiences. <clears throat> to start, I was thinking of perseverance. Uh, the reason for that is we're gonna encounter a lot of challenges. The decision to start being one of the most difficult decisions to make, right? And we're going to face a lot of naysayers. We're going to face a lot of uh, 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 no's. You're going to get more no than yes. So you just got to persevere. If you believe the, the, the work you want to do, you believe it's going to achieve impact, just persevere through. Now, I think I come from the product point of view. I think for anyone who wants to start something, to uh, make something, yeah. need to be very, very truthful, looking at the uniqueness of your product. Really need to examine the uniqueness of the product. And, and you know, the other, of course, there are so many other uh, factors, parameters so important for success. But uh, you need to center around the product. So what do you want to sell and, and how unique it is? Yep, thank you. I, mean, thank I think there's you. actually um, coherence uh, between what you know, John and what you guys said, which at the end of the day, is you just have to really work hard and persevere and never give up. But uh, I, it's been fantastic uh, attending here. So thank you. Thanks, Chuck. <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna turn over to the uh, online questions. It turns out there aren't that many. Um, these are the questions. Okay, it's not showing up on the screen. Uh, okay, let me just ask the first one. Uh, this is a person who did not identify themselves. Uh, the question is, how do you think industry and academia can join forces to deliver greater impact? Um, I'm actually going to start with John first, although it may not be obvious, but... Uh, John, do you, do you have private sector partners in... in, in in let's say the James Webb telescope, or is it entirely a NASA project? Well, uh, it's a NASA project in the sense that we received the money from NASA headquarters and then we spend it on companies. Okay. So um, I think 90% or more of the money that we receive is spent on companies to do things. Mm -hmm. So we recruit them all through the proposal process. They write a proposal, they say they can do the thing we need, and we say, oh, okay. 
So um, and that, that applies to even uh, things that you hear about, like a SpaceX and so forth. Uh, mm -hmm. We buy rockets. Okay, we don't so tell them how to build the rocket. So you were using SpaceX rockets to to deliver the the telescope into space. Well, we did not this time because uh, our international partnership uh, called for the European uh, partners to produce the rocket for mm -hmm. us. So mm -hmm. they did. Uh, but in general, what what is yeah. yeah? But how how the important European is it? Is also a private company that it's. Uh, it was not a government agency in Europe that built it either. It's a uh, private company. Mm -hmm. So m most of the work that uh, big NASA projects do is on contract to uh, some other organizations. Mm -hmm. So, so they, they are important partners. The ability to work with, yeah, is if they didn't uh, exist. We could not do the telescope. Mm -hmm. are, are there any downsides? I mean, are there times when you wish I didn't have to depend on somebody else? Well, of course. Um, but on the other hand, um, they know what things to do, and I don't. I don't know them. Mm -hmm. So, as in you're thinking about building a team, you have to have a team that includes all the kinds of expertise that cannot possibly exist in a single organization. No organization is big enough to build a telescope like this um, because nobody knows everything. Thanks, John. Professor. I want to take a crack at that. How do you think industry and academia can join forces to deliver greater impact? Uh, I think this kind of is collaboration or, or joint force is quite natural. And, and for a corporation, for a company, uh, not many companies will do very deep, uh, low TRL research, right? technology readiness level. And uh, you, you need a sizable, uh, very well-run, profitable company to do a deeper and a deeper research. And so many times, you, as a company, you know, the overall you have your research and development target and strategy. You need to work with the university. I think that's the best way. Mm. You need to leave uh, more challenging, scientifically challenging topics, directions, to academia to, to explore, right? And work together uh, in, in a more freer, more uh, open environment. And, and uh, I, I think that is a better environment compared to in a company to, to be more open-minded and, and really uh, discover, invent some very new stuff. And, but once the TRL levels raise up, right, when, when it comes to like TRL like four, five, six, then some company will start to take it over or will take on to develop together. Uh, like uh, I think there is a great uh, concept or, or the practice in Singapore uh, that is called Corp Lab, mm -hmm. uh, Corporation Lab, right, Corporate Lab in local universities. So we set up a COP lab in one of the local universities to work very closely together with the academias and to, to take advantage of multi, multidisciplinary uh, options and possibilities and to work on real low TRL stuff, right? but not from one. One, two, three, probably really we need to collaborate with academia and as their research projects. But for five, four, four, five, six, maybe that is the area that we need to focus on COP Lab. Mm -hmm. Then okay. once you raise up to like seven, eight, nine, probably uh, more and more, it will be more suitable for the corporate to develop products. Mm -hmm. So I think that it is it's a very natural uh, uh, collaboration and a lot of opportunities there. I think for people really love academia research work, love the university uh, research institute environment, it's not really necessary. You must jump out to, to, to join mm -hmm. a company. Uh, it's a great opportunity there. Thank you. Okay, I see another question here. 
I love working, um, not identified, anonymous. Uh, I love working in a lab, but worry about the instability of finding a new PhD or postdoc every four years. Any advice? Uh, John, you want to take a crack at this? I, I suppose this is you, you, your situation is probably closest to, to, to the context here. Well, mine is pretty clearly different because uh, um, I don't actually work in the lab. I work with people who work in the lab. Uh, mm -hmm. So I see. Uh, in our situation, we have people who are basically in their jobs for 10, 20, 30 years. So it's pretty stable where I am um, because we have long-term projects. Um, and so it's kind of the opposite of the corporate world uh, close to me. Uh, when we hire a company to do something, uh, those companies have to be very agile because when they've completed the job that we've asked them to do, uh, they may or may not need the people that they have. So they have to be always looking for the next contract. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, it's pretty interesting and tricky. So, Lihan? So the, uh, people you have... are paid more, but they have a higher risk. Yeah. Thanks, John. Uh, I mean, you, you, I, I imagine you must have quite a few PhDs in your labs. Uh, we do. Or, we do. And or postdocs. We, we, yeah. we have about Is there, is there a big turnover? We ha no, actually, we don't no? have a lot okay. of turnover in the last eight years. But to be honest, I think stability is overrated. Why should we have stability? Whether it's in academia, whether it's in industry, why should there be stability? I mean, looking at now, uh, on average, a, a grad student or through our career, we have seven to eight jobs. If you count it back, yeah, every two, three, four years, you change a job. Sometimes because of the situation, sometimes because of your interests change, and down the road, maybe our family want to move to a different location. So I think the best way to, to my advice is forget about stability. Focus on why are you in the lab for that one year, two year, three year, or four years, however long that is. Mm -hmm. But if you put stability in that equation, I, I don't know which but, job to do. But I think the question that. is coming from the standpoint of, let's say, the manager or the head of the lab, though. He or she doesn't want to have, you know, how do, I, I suppose he or her, his or her question is, how do you create an environment so that people are not leaving every four years? If I'm not wrong. Right. right. I, I think for PhD, generally, we stay there for, you know, four or five years, and then we move on anyway. Mm -hmm. And for postdoc, at least when we move into a, 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 a commercial research environment, uh, most of my research team has been with us ever since the founding. Mm -hmm. right? So as long as you know, our skill set is still relevant, the company's research direction has not changed, even though we may move from disease to different disease, but the team never really moved. And right. then we bring in new skill sets machine learning, you know, I hesitate to say AI, but data science, right? So there can be stability both in academia as well as industry, but provided you actually want that stability. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm gonna come back to, to the audience here. Uh, I'm so sorry, I know you guys have been waiting for a long time, uh, but I believe the young man in green came first, so um, please, please go. Hi, yeah. um, my name is Kazuki from Japan, and uh, so this is a little bit off topic, but uh, my question is regarding to um, the country-based difference of the environment of um, um, startups or ventures. So I'm, I'm from Japan, and Japan is, uh, uh, for some reason, it's not really good at uh, incubating ventures or startups. So. So this means there are not many uh, young scientists try to make uh, startup or ventures um, in their career. Um, so in this context, I, as far as I understand, Singapore is much more successful on this point. To I mean, incubating young scientists try to trying to um, um, make some startups. Um, so I was wondering what makes um, Singapore. Uh, um, more successful uh, in this point. So could you tell, tell me your, your thoughts on this? This question is for you, Trey. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> um, look, we're reasonably successful, all right? I don't want to oversell it, but uh, certainly we've uh, 
you know, we, we've created conditions so that today, if there's another Prof. Chu or another Li Han, hopefully it will be smoother. Right? So today, uh, you know, we, some of the work that we do, building communities, very important. People think of community, what is that? Is it a nice to have? You know, how important is that? But I think it's important for to build communities so that potential entrepreneurs can meet other entrepreneurs, understand their experience. They can meet people who may be manufacturing their prospective product and they can learn, you know, is this, is it, can we actually make it? Uh, there may be service providers, you know, people who may uh, need, you know, let's say you need uh, a quality management system, you may meet someone in these communities. So we believe community work is very important. Uh, I think the presence of venture capital is sort of, uh, it's, it, it, you, once you hit a certain level, it becomes a virtuous cycle. I mean, if you look at ecosystems like Israel, I mean, it's really incredible, right? I mean, you, success breeds success. Um, and then, of course, there's an element of culture. So, again, if we look at Silicon Valley or, or Israel, there's a, there's a very unique culture. Right, that the circumstances have, have conspired to, to produce. So every country is going to be different. I don't think we can compare. Uh, what we've done is, is to try to address the bits that we can control. Uh, I think we're, we're reasonably successful. I think we're seeing more and more young people uh, do this. Uh, but, you know, there's still room for improvement. And uh, hang around, join us. If, if you're not seeing opportunity back in Japan, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Come talk to us. Yeah. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, finally. <laughs> Young lady in the orange trousers. Uh, greetings, everyone. My name is Carol Zetungwenya. I'm from the University of Cape Town in South Africa. So my question today is on technological readiness. So when your technology is ready to hit the market, but the market is not ready for your technology, what would you advise one to do? I ask this question because there's often a disconnect between the work that we do in the lab and societal needs and industrial needs. Do you advise someone to stick around in postdoc until there's enough societal and political pressure to accelerate the uptake of your technology? Prof or Lihan? Go ahead, Lihan. So, 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 so I, allow me to ask this. Um, if the market is not ready for the technology, what makes us think the technology is ready? <laughs> Proof of concept? I'm sorry? Proof of concept. The technology has been tested to work. It's yes. just the market and probably might require a, a mental shift from society to take up the technology as yet. Right. So... Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm in a bit of a similar situation uh, uh, years ago, right? Um, everybody wants to cure cancer, everybody wants to detect disease early, but nobody seems to want to pay for it. Right? Or at least f people haven't figured out a way to pay for it. Or the technology may be too expensive, right? We may be able to cure cancer if we spend $5 million on a personalized treatment. So in, in that situation, I guess the question is, if you're able to find the venture capital to support that early journey to get it through, because a lot of you know, sharing economy, Uber, Grab, burns a lot of money. Until today, it's still burning money to get the market ready. Right? So if you're able to convince you know, the venture capital to put on the money to, to create the market, or to educate the market, then, then that's fine. If not, then perhaps uh, uh, you know, stay in the academic environment or go into a research institution to try to bring down the cost if cost is the issue, or to work with the right stakeholder to educate the market to get it ready. But I think there's no, again, there's no black and white answer. I mean, if you look at Elon Musk, I mean, who'd have thunk it, right? He wants to put man on Mars. He dreamt of electric vehicles before there was even infrastructure. Certainly the market wasn't ready. Uh, so a lot of it is also, you know, just how visionary and how determined you are. So it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a little, 
it's, it's, a, it's an experiment. You titrate to effect. John, you want to chip in? You know, like, you know, what's, 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 at what point does NASA think, okay, this James Webb thing, this telescope is, you know, is it, is it driven by the fact that you could do certain things technologically or, you know, were there other factors that, that, that were at play with James Webb? Well, the, excuse me, the way that we got started was a committee wrote a book that said, please build this telescope. Uh, and then they outlined all the scientific reasons that it was so important that this was the, clearly the next scientific discovery after Hubble. Mm -hmm. So uh, it had to be big, it has to be uh, cold, it has to be um, capable of infrared observations. So they, they wrote out this wonderful book about the scientific discoveries that could happen. So th then it was NASA's job to make a plan that would carry out uh, developing all the technologies to the necessary TRL-6 before we could choose and complete a design. And then, um, of course, that always turns out to be harder than one thinks. Uh, and um, it turned out and after we had all that and we designed the thing, then the hardest problem is proving that it works. Um, it's much more expensive to prove that it works than it is to build it. So. Um, Anyway, we definitely go by a TRL schedule. We have standards of, of reviews and we have to satisfy external uh, reviewers that we've done a good job at every step. So there's a process uh, to say, yes, it's mature enough to go on to the next step. They hadn't made any big mistakes and, mm -hmm. uh, and they're ready. And of course, Congress won't send us the money if we don't do that. Uh, how, how much money are, are we talking about, John? Uh, with the James Altogether, Webb Telescope? Altogether, the U.S. portion is $10 billion, about. Uh, and I'm not sure how big the European and Canadian contributions are. They're smaller, uh, but they're still large. Wow. <laughs> so, but over the course of 27 years, it's, uh, well, it sounds like a lot, but uh, compared with the size of the space budget, commercial and military together, which is about $400 billion each year, this is still a tiny fraction of the of the worldwide expenditures on space, but it's just the one that's in the news every day. Indeed, thanks, thanks, John. Okay, let's take the next question. Uh, okay, it looks like everyone is lining up over there. So, uh, young lady in the white T-shirt, please go ahead. Hi, I'm Felicia from Singapore. Can you can you speak up a little bit? Hello, I'm Felicia from Singapore. So I was just wondering, like, for businesses that actually stem from novel technology, how do you actually sustain it? Because there may come a point where, like, you may not be able to grow your customer base anymore or expand your product line based on your novel technology. So, and then we know that for novel technologies, the development pathway may be longer, much longer. So in that scenario, how do you sustain your business in the long run? Well, I suppose you've just heard uh, Lihan and, and Prof. Uh, yeah, it's important to get that right before you start. Um, okay, well, I mean, when you hit a brick wall, what did you, what did you do, Prof? I think <laughs> that first of all, still like you need to reassess your technology and your product. Uh, and, and it seems that the, probably you don't have a TRL-9 product, right? So, so you need to still need to continue to work on it, but if you already have certain applications, right, you sell to a smaller audience or a smaller market, then, then I think it would be a, a wonderful base to, to continuously to improve on it uh -huh. and to base on what you have and make it better. And of course, you need to think loud about go-to-market strategy, right? And how to expand your market, expand your audience. And, and if you, your product already accepted in certain area, certain audience, then obviously there is, there is a value in it, right? But you need to make your product, make a product better is a daily issue. Yeah, it's a continuous improvement. Yeah, you gotta assess, reassess, 
be honest with yourself and keep improving, keep innovating. That's the only way out of it. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Uh, yeah. Pisha Yut from Thailand. So, actually, I'm a co-founder of Thai Kakao Starter Cultures and for the fermentation process. I'm sorry, could, could you say that again? A founder of? Thai, Thailand Kakao Gogo, you know, for okay. chocolate. Yep. Okay. Starter culture for the fermentation process, which intend to enhance the quality of the taste and flavor of Thai chocolate. But sometimes, when I go to the meet the uh, farmer or, or my customer, they think that I'm coming like a scientist. The difficult thing is coming to them. Do you have any suggestion of this? I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, did you all catch the question, or you want to go ahead and answer? I, if I, if I, if I caught you correctly, uh, you're saying that you present yourself as a scientist, where your customer may not appreciate the way you present yes. your technology. Yes. Yeah. So, so I think it's really you know to 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 put yourself out of that scientist head and think like your customer, right? And and perhaps in you know in, in 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 your particular case, have you worked in the field to think like them to understand why they are coming from, right? Um, the best is to to be in your customer's shoe, experience what they are doing, understand the pain point, and understand why your technology is relevant and how would that make their life better. Yeah, and the quick question is, do you think that the startup is only a word? of trainings, of train, word of trains, and it's gonna be sustainable in the future? The word of startup, do you think it's only a trend or it's gonna be sustained in the future? Is it only a trend? Yeah. I, don't, I don't think it's a trend. Um, a startup basically means that we're taking something new into a highly agile environment to develop it to the next step. All right, so I, in, in fact, if the world stops doing startup, I think we have a very big problem. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi. Hi, I'm Danica from University College London. Um, and we realize the, um, the importance of getting feedback, but um, in the field of biomedical engineering or biomedical devices, it's quite easy, based on my experience, to end up in this uh, never-ending cycle of trying to fulfill um, what, the, the feed, what people want. So um, like uh, we have easy access to the feedback from our funders. Um, our funders want this, the, our doctors want that, or our patients want this. Mm -hmm. And then it, it comes to a point where we don't know when we're ready to launch. So I know that the, um, there's always a way to improve and research work never ends, and everyone here knows that. But how do you know for yourself when you're actually ready to launch this product or launch this telescope? John, you want to take that? I mean, earlier you had said, get advice, get help. But sometimes they may yeah. be too much of a good thing. So how do you, yeah. how do you well, integrate? Can, yeah, so I can only give the example that I know, which is that NASA, um, we have to convince serious engineers and managers that we've done the right thing. And we have books written of standards about how to tell this. So we have to get uh, people that are not working on the project to come and read what we've written and uh, listen to our stories for days on end to say, have they done everything they should do? And uh, we have uh, hundreds and thousands of written documents to say, uh, um, this is what we said we would do and we've done it. So um, there's a very formal process that we go through to make sure that we yeah. are ready because uh, we have to, because uh, failure of a piece of space hardware is often not repairable. So we must do everything right. Uh, so uh, when it's, uh, if I try to imagine how this applies to uh, a commercial venture or a startup, it's a little different because uh, it's a little less definite what people need to have from you and it's somewhat subject to persuasion uh, mm -hmm. but it's still good to have people who will be hard on you and tell you uh, when you're making a mistake uh, one thing i've a lesson i've drawn from my history is 
Never trust the boss, especially if you <laughs> are the boss. Thank you, John. Okay, we have a minute and a half. So, Lihan, you want to quickly take that, just, you know, uh, how do you know when to launch, when you're, how do you distill the feedback that you get or the various inputs? First of all, uh, everyone's got a feedback, especially physicians. So, you know, PhD is pretty bad, physicians. Okay. Um, the second part is for biomedical devices. Uh, the moment we lock in a spec, and going to production and clinical trial, you can't change that, right? So it's critical in the early days, there's a certain uh, minimal performance that everybody agree, at least you know, your, your key stakeholders agree. So the moment you hit that, lock in the spec, move on to the next step. Then you can think about generation two or three in the later stage, but you have to lock in. You have to lock down so that you can move to the next step back. Right? There's ISO standards on that. Um, but yeah, don't don't take everybody's advice. That's never ending. <laughs> Prof. Yeah, exactly. I think uh, in our line also, we 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 call the POR, uh, the process of record. That means you need to lock down. You need to lock locking the process to uh, generations by generations. So one generation completes, you lock it in POR, and you need to push to the market. And any further improvement, that's generation two. Thank, Thank you. you. Perfect timing. With almost surgical precision, we have hit the time limit. So I want to thank our panelists. John, once again, for joining us from Maryland. Um, have a great night ahead. Thank you so much for joining us. Lihan, Prof. Equally, thank you, thank you, thank you so you much for joining us, and thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lim, and thank you, panelists, one again, for that illuminating discussion. Um, if I could invite you just to have some refreshments outside with the participants shortly. Um, just a couple more housekeeping announcements. The next program takes place online. We have to create hosting and online engagement and sharing on how our food needs more innovation. Um, for poster presenters who were with us last evening, we have your appreciation um, certificates, please do collect them at the registration counters outside now during this break till 11 a.m. or you can do so during lunch later as well. Um, the next session will take place online um, at 11, so do come back by about 10.55 for Dr. John Mather's um, next plenary lecture. Please enjoy your break.
Welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a good break. Um, okay, can I just invite the rest of you to take your seats quickly? We will continue this morning's program with Dr. John Mather. I think some of you saw him earlier. He's the winner of the 2006 Nobel Prize in Physics, and he will be talking about the topic opening the infrared <coughs> treasure chest with the James Webb Space Telescope. I believe many of us are excited about this. The Q&A session will be moderated later by Mr. Christopher Lake. So without further ado, Dr. John Mather, please. Yes, thank you for asking me to speak. I have a wonderful story to tell you about the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, what you should see here is the uh, first chart. Uh, here's the great telescope as we imagine it is in outer space. You see a great golden hexagon made out of 18 smaller hexagons. That is the mirror, which collects starlight and galaxy light and focuses it down into the rest of the instruments. It is protected by five layers of a metallized plastic, which we call a sunshade. So the telescope is always in the dark. Um, it is a joint international project of NASA with European and Canadian space agencies. So we have contributions from March, much of the world in here. Um, I am the senior project scientist, but I'm representing the work of 20,000 people who built this observatory. And um, I'm telling you what, uh, about 10,000 astronomers will be using it. So there it is, the magnificent observatory in outer space. By the way, it is coated with gold, that mirror, because that's the best reflector for infrared light. So why are we doing this? Um, I've had these questions since childhood, and uh, many of you do also. Where did we come from? Uh, what is the history of the universe? Uh, are there any other people out there? Uh, there's, we certainly see them in science fiction stories, but uh, are, are they real? Could they be real? And if so, where could they be? A very basic question for biology is, uh, is uh, the life, complex life that we see uh, require some kind of extraordinary unlikely process uh, akin to a miracle that would require divine intervention? Or is it something that happens every time the conditions are right, uh, which I would call a thermodynamic imperative, something that will always happen? And finally, of course, how far can we go? Uh, we already know that we could go to Mars. Um, I don't know that we could get any farther in the, in besides our own solar system, but if, as astronomers, we can travel with our imagination as far as you like. So here is the scientific story of how we got here. Um, we know that the universe is expanding, which is to say the dif distant galaxies are rushing away from us very fast. We know this history has been unstable. Uh, the universe has reorganized itself into complex systems, starting out with a very smooth initial conditions. It is extremely large. Uh, we uh, write uh, uh, equations as though we think it's infinite, that is to say unlimited in extent, although it has an age of about 13.8 billion years. So even things that might be quite rare do have a chance to occur. So people are probably rare, but we are obviously here. Uh, from biology, we have learned that uh, stored information can control the unlimited complexity of life. We know about the, uh, the DNA molecules, and we've known they've been uh, the double helix since about 1953. Um, what we know less about is how is that digital code interpreted uh, to control the life of a cell and a, and a living thing. So uh, on the other hand, we do know that evolution is possible. Uh, because of this uh, digital code and, uh, and uh, our ability to make mistakes uh, in the copying the code when we produce new generations. We've also learned as engineers that uh, there are nested feedback loops that control uh, things, and in particular, the biologists call this homeostasis, so that uh, I've been here uh, with my name and my identity since uh, 1946, and that's accomplished by the individual cells maintaining themselves and even replacing themselves, even though almost all of their atoms have been exchanged many times with other atoms. So uh, our identity is maintained while the parts are replaced. It's quite a remarkable story. So uh, in physics, we talk about the four forces of nature. Uh, 
Uh, quantum mechanics uh, is known to describe three of the four forces. Um, the, we have two kinds of nuclear force called the strong force and the weak force. And we have also the electromagnetic forces that uh, you, you read and study and that's calculable relatively easily. Um, anyway, those quantum mechanical forces control the shapes and of all the possible combinations of these little wavy particles. So uh, the building blocks of the universe are, the, uh, are these Lego blocks that uh, uh, attach themselves to one another according to the quantum mechanics. Then we have the fourth force is gravitation, which Einstein taught us is actually operates by bending space time. Um, and then, uh, well, we, in, a, in another sense, uh, we astronomers talk about the fact that it has negative specific heat. That is to say, a, a gravitating object can be unstable. Um, as it uh, loses energy, uh, it gets hotter, which is a bit surprising, but that's how gravity works. Um, anyway, we know how to calculate things at equilibrium, but that, that's never very interesting compared with the changes that occur when something is not in equilibrium. So. All of life is not in equilibrium. And uh, so it's a great challenge for all of us biologists to understand this. So astronomers look back in time. We uh, see, uh, of course, at the speed of light, we see things as they were when light was emitted, not as those things are now. So um, we can see the center of our galaxy as it was about 25,000 years ago or looking back towards what we call the Big Bang, um, about 13.8 billion years is how far we can see, um, because that's about the age of the universe. So how do we know these things? We survey the universe with triangles and with the comparison of the brightness of standard candles. So the, the, the section of trigonometry would have been well understood to the ancients uh, thousands of years ago. Uh, they probably would have understood our standard candle method too of uh, measuring ratios of distances from the ratios of brightnesses of similar objects. So we survey the universe this way. And then we also can measure the rates of motion of galaxies toward us or away from us. It's called the Doppler shift. So we know that the wavelengths of light that are emitted or absorbed by particular chemicals, uh, atoms and molecules, and when often we see a distant star or galaxy where the wavelengths are all multiplied by some factor uh, and not just the originals. So that lets us then interpret that measurement as a velocity. So we can say now the distant universe is coming toward us or going away from us with this method. So back in 1929, uh, Edwin Hubble drew us this graph which shows the distant galaxies are going away from us with immense speeds and that the speed is approximately proportional to distance. So uh, this is a wonderful surprise back in 1929, almost uh, 100 years ago. Uh, and so this was the first time that people could imagine that the universe even had an age. Divide the distance by the speed, and you get the age of the universe, 1929. So it was predicted that the universe should have a hot initial conditions. If you imagine running the expansion backwards, and you say, well, what was it like when it was very young? Could have been very hot. And if that was true, then the universe should be filled with the cosmic microwave radiation. It was discovered in 1965. A Nobel Prize was given for that. Um, our first project, my first project, was to measure this radiation with a satellite called the Cosmic Background Explorer. Uh, and it worked very well. It measured the spectrum and made a map of the early universe. And of course, that's what got us a trip to Stockholm. So this is a map of the universe as it was when it was young. Um, we see in, in every direction with millimeter wave eyes. And so we see uh, the place in space and time where the earlier universe is opaque because it's too hot. Uh, so we see hot and cold spots in the map of the early universe. And we say, well, what happened then? Uh, we think that um, this explains our existence, that they, some of these spots represent density variations in the early universe that uh, were able to stop the expansion of matter locally, stop it from expanding and pull it back in to make galaxies and black holes and eventually planets and people. So we personally are here because of those spots in that map. 
So how would we know if this story is true? Well, of course, we build other observatories. The Hubble Space Telescope is 32 years old. Uh, it's still working beautifully because it's been upgraded five times by astronauts. And we've learned many, many things from it. Uh, one of which was that the Hubble was not able to see far enough to tell us the whole story. So back in 1995, a little book was written that said, please build us a new telescope that is more powerful even than the Hubble. So here's a, another story about this one and another explanation, which basically says it's an international partnership. The telescope is cold. Um, we have instruments that are contributed to the mission from United States, Europe, and Canada. Um, and the telescope was launched on a European rocket called the Ariane 5 on Christmas morning of 2021. So uh, we hoped we would get uh, five or 10 years of, of uh, flight lifetime, and it now looks like we'll get 20 or 25. So we're very pleased with all of that good luck. So this is what it looked like when it went up. Uh, it was actually a bright sunny morning there, cloudy actually, in, uh, in French Guiana, where the launch site is. I watched this at launch from my sofa in uh, my house because of COVID. Uh, everyone who could stay home did stay home. Anyway, we have sent it out to a place called the Lagrange Point 2. It orbits around that uh, because that's 1.5 million kilometers from Earth, and it's a good place to put the telescope. Standing around L2, we put up our one-sided umbrella, and it protects the telescope from the heat of the sun, the Earth, and the moon all at once. So this is what the telescope looked like as it unfolded itself after launch. Uh, a um, rather difficult thing to be sure about. Uh, we had to rehearse and test this observatory many times to make sure that it would actually function correctly. Um, and there were 340 something uh, particular objects that all had to function perfectly or the observatory might not have functioned correctly at all. Uh, we've really worked very hard to make sure they would all work, and they all did. So here we're unfolding the covers over the sunshade. It protects the telescope from the heat of the sun. And eventually you'll see it unfolding itself to the right shape in outer space, um, which is um, very complicated. So you look at this and you say, why is it so complicated? And the answer is quite simple. There's no other way we could think of to do it. So after it's all unfolded, it is still not in focus. And we had uh, spent altogether six months of focusing the telescope and checking out all of the equipment to make sure it would function as we designed it. And it does. So there it is in outer space. So why are we using infrared light? Why do we want to see infrared light? This is a Hubble telescope picture showing a star being born inside a cloud of dust. And uh, at visible wavelengths that you can see with your eye, this is what it looks like. You cannot really see the star inside. Um, if you use a, a near infrared wavelengths, you can see through the dust cloud quite well. You can see the star is inside there, sending out two jets of material as they often do. So we're observing uh, with the web very similar things like that. I'll show you more. Um, we want to see cool objects that are too cool to send out their own starlight. Uh, so uh, we see dust illuminated by stars and dust radiating heat. So here is a thing called the Southern Ring Planetary Nebula, which is not a planet, but uh, actually a dying star. Of and on the right-hand side, you see there are actually two stars in the middle. And that's possible because we can pick up the infrared light. And this turns out to be very, very interesting and complicated because now we think there are actually four or five stars there in the middle that have made this thing come out as a not spherical, but very strangely shaped object. So um, we're even able to see with the Webb telescope um, an example of this, um, here are two stars orbiting around one another. Uh, once each orbit, uh, the, one of the stars sends out a puff of uh, dust grains that go out into space. And um, there we actually took, took a picture with the Webb telescope that shows exactly that story. This is a dying star that we're seeing here. 
Uh, we also study space uh, infrared because space is expanding and stretching out the light of the distant galaxies to longer wavelengths. So this is how this works. Uh, space expands the, as the light travels through space to get to us. The wavelengths are also expanded by the same amount. So when we see a distant galaxy, we see uh, much redder, that is to say, much longer wavelengths than what it sent out to us when we, it was uh, emitted. So we, we use this technique to look out into space and to look back in time. So what have we seen? This is the first picture we released. The President Joe Biden released this at the White House on July 11th. And it's showing uh, several things. Uh, there's a beautiful bright star in the middle. Uh, this little thing with the spikes on it is just an ordinary star. And the, uh, and the, uh, the spikes that stick out of it are due to the diffraction of light uh, on the hexagons of the mirror. Uh, in the center, we also see these beautiful, bright, nearby, very large galaxies. Um, there's a whole cluster of galaxies here. Um, and however, what we're most interested in here are the things that are more distant, the reddish and orangish pictures, like these arcs that you see uh, nearby the big galaxies. These uh, are actually much, much more distant galaxies that have been magnified by the curvature of space. Einstein told us that gravity operates by curving space-time, and it, he even imagined that it could be useful as a lens uh, to magnify distant objects, but he thought we would never be able to use it. Here we are using it on purpose. We have catalogs of hundreds of places like this, and that uh, we have found astonishing things with them. So I'll show you a little bit more. Uh, here is a, a very highly magnified image of one of them. Uh, we call it the sparkler galaxy because it seems to be full of these little tiny clusters, uh, which are called globular clusters in our modern galaxy in the Milky Way. Here we are seeing them as they were billions of years ago, nine billion years ago, when uh, the light was sent out from that distant galaxy. We have been able to look at this object. This is called Stefan's Quintet. There are five galaxies in here. Uh, the one on the left, this uh, one with a sort of bluish tint around it, is quite nearby. And uh, the telescope is actually able to see individual stars in that galaxy. Um, in the center, we see two galaxies that are colliding and merging together. In the next few hundred million years, they will become a single galaxy uh, of a very different shape. In the process of colliding, they are producing uh, domains of new stars being born in these uh, reddish areas. And uh, at the top, we have a black hole, uh, something we call an active galactic nucleus. So in the, in the top one, there's a place where material is falling into the black hole. It's getting compressed as it falls in. It's getting heated up to enormous temperatures so that we are able to recognize that if something is orbiting around the black hole and sending us this immense amount of light. So it's one of our big questions uh, now is, do the black holes form in galaxies or do the black holes cause galaxies to form? One of the great mysteries of science for us. Uh, here's a beautiful picture we call the cartwheel galaxy because this is a demonstration of what happens when one galaxy collides with another. Uh, the top one, the one on the left here, uh, went straight through the middle of the big galaxy and caused a big splash. So you can see the, the gaseous material that has been pressed out from the center of this big galaxy <coughs> and is uh, forming new generations of stars in this great beautiful ring around the outside. <coughs> so this is a place where we can study how do stars form when something dramatic happens to the galaxy that they're in. So. That's a, a laboratory for us to study the formation of new stars in a very violent collision. Closer to home, <clears throat> we have this beautiful picture of a galaxy. It's a, when we take a picture with the Hubble, it looks like a very ordinary spiral galaxy. And it is, but now that we look at it with infrared eyes, we see that the gaseous material and the dust had been moved around a lot by the formation of new stars. So in the middle, right in the middle, there's no dust obscuring the center of this object. So that's why it looks blue. Over, over here in the lower right-hand corner, you see some, an example of a very large hole. 
that's been made in the uh, gaseous distribution. A uh, new generation of stars was born in that hole. They made so much heat that they pressed the, the uh, gaseous material to go away and, and made a hole there, uh, which on the other hand also caused new stars to be born around the edge. This is a place for us to learn about the formation of new stars in a distant galaxy. Uh, here is a place where they're being born today. This is a place we call the Pillars of Creation. And this is a new picture taken with the Webb telescope at a wide range of different wavelengths. So what we're now able to do is we can see that there's a huge, very rapid wind blowing from the upper right to the lower left, uh, changing the shape of this cloud of gaseous material. We can see where stars have just been born inside with these little red dots that are inside the cloud. There's one, a brand new one that was just formed. So uh, this is a laboratory for us to learn about the formation of stars very near to us, close to home. Uh, here is a picture of a star that is actually forming right now. Uh, you do not see this star because as it happens, it is surrounded by a, 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 its own dust cloud, which is orbiting around it. And we are sighting right in uh, to the edge of this uh, disk. So we don't see the star, we see the, the uh, opaque obscuration across the middle. Right in the middle, there's a star, then there's a dust disk around here, which will presumably be forming uh, a new solar system with many planets. So if we were to come back to this object in another 100,000 years or a million years, we would probably see planets, but not nearly as much dust. And we are observing other planets directly. This is our method for doing it. Uh, we uh, wait for a planet to go in front of its star. So uh, we have a big catalog of uh, known targets for this. And so we planned altogether 62 observations in the first year of the mission. So um, these were mostly discovered by the TESS mission, a, a small satellite taking pictures to see Sorry, um, yeah, mostly these are the t uh, came from the test mission. Um, it looks to see which stars are blinking, and it tells us which ones are the most interesting, and tells us about uh, when to look, about how big the planets are, and about how warm they are. There's even one system which is very close to Earth called the Trappist-1 system that was discovered from the ground. It has altogether seven planets that are about the size of Earth and about three of them are about the temperature of Earth. So those are very interesting to us because we imagine if they had atmospheres, they could be like Earth. However, um, this is just a difficult problem to know. Um, we did not design the Webb telescope to look at these objects originally. Um, we didn't know they were there, but now we do. So we're trying our very best. So we hope to be able to tell you um, what's the atmospheric composition of planets around other stars, and especially interesting if they're very small planets like Earth. Of course, it's easier if the planet is bigger, and we have done one of them. Uh, this is uh, called a uh, hot gas giant planet. It's like Jupiter, except it's much closer to its own star. So it's even much hotter than Jupiter. And we've done spectroscopy. So we've four different ways to do that with the Webb telescope. Um, we spread out the light into a spectrum, which is to say, uh, how bright is it at each different wavelength of light? Um, so in this picture, we see that there, is, there are signs of sodium and potassium and carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide and water and even sulfur dioxide way out there in this other star, right, in this other planet. So we know the technique works. What we're unsure about is whether uh, nature has given us anything to see in those smaller planets that might be like Earth. Of course, everybody wants to know, uh, are there planets that are like Earth? And the answer is we can't be sure yet. Maybe we'll find out something with the observatory uh, about those very small ones. And maybe it might just be that nature says, no, they have no atmospheres, they're only little rocks. So we wait on the measurements to find out the answer to that question. Um, we have, of course, also looked in the solar system. Uh, here is a beautiful picture of Jupiter. 
which is a, a huge technical accomplishment because Jupiter is actually rotating while we're taking a picture. Um, you see the, the great red spot doesn't look red when you use infrared light. Um, we see that Jupiter has an aurora at the north and another one at the south. Um, we see some of the satellites uh, directly. Uh, we even see that Jupiter has rings. Uh, they're much smaller and less bright than the ones that Saturn has, of course. Um, but uh, there it is, uh, the great king of the planets, uh, as we have never seen it before. Uh, we even, as you know, uh, tried to deflect an asteroid. Uh, we uh, sent out the DART mission, a NASA project, to hit the asteroid with a big piece of metal. So uh, we watched the collision with the Hubble telescope and with the Webb telescope, and many other astronomers also watched it. Uh, the question would be, well, what happens? Um, so the answer for this one is a lot of material comes flying out of the asteroid, produce a lot of debris. Uh, and uh, because of all that, the asteroid moves much farther in its orbit than we were expecting. Um, if it just were, uh, if there were no material being ejected, it would move much less than what we saw. So this is a very important result for the Protection of Earth. Um, as you know, uh, asteroids are a hazard. The big one that came 65 million, billion, 65 million years ago uh, wiped out the, the, the uh, dinosaurs. And so we're here because of them. But we don't want to be wiped out by another one. So it's good to know where the asteroids are and whether any of them are coming at us and what to do about it when they do. We're very interested in Titan. Titan is a satellite of Saturn. Uh, Saturn um, is cold, uh, but Titan is interesting because of something remar remarkable. It is such a large satellite that has its own atmosphere with its clouds and weather. Um, on Titan, um, there are lakes and rivers and there is rain, uh, but the lakes, rivers, and rain are made of hydrocarbons methane and ethane mostly. So this is an interesting place to go to study uh, another form of geology. The surface is mostly ice, water ice. And here's an interesting place also where nature has done the experiment to see if uh, liquid water is the only kind of place where you could find life. So we will be sending a lander out there with a, its own helicopter. Uh, a quadcopter in 2034. So in about 12 years, you should be hearing about what is the surface of Titan like in much more detail than we know today. Uh, we've got a nice picture of Neptune uh, with some quite remarkable pictures of the glowing uh, warmer regions that are showing through under the clouds there. And also Neptune has its own ring system as well as several satellites. So everybody wants to know how far can we go out into space? Well, here's an opinion. This is not a, all of a fact, but we certainly have already seen that robots can go everywhere. They're cleaning up uh, nuclear reactor damage. They put things together in hostile places. Uh, we use them to, uh, to uh, do surgery on people, so sometimes they work better than human hands. We've sent them to all of the planets. We've sent them to asteroids and comets and moons. So robots can go everywhere. Um, they don't have to breathe. They don't have. They can survive temperatures and pressures that we cannot. So we're doing that. We have robots on Mars currently collecting rock samples to send home to Earth to see if there's any sign of life on Mars. As you know, the computers are getting smarter every year. Um, and the interesting question from is, uh, at least in part, well, who owns them? And that's a subject for another day. We do know that people are very fragile. So we cannot go to outer space without a lot of protection. Uh, and it's actually pretty dangerous for us to even travel to Mars because of cosmic rays. Cosmic rays uh, come from outside uh, our galaxy. Uh, mostly, and from the galaxy, and they penetrate right through any kind of shielding that you can make. So um, it's very hard to protect our astronauts from them. So they could be sick. 
when they get to Mars, we want to make sure that they're not. If you really want to go very fast, you need a fusion reactor. Uh, we can't even build one yet here on Earth. So this is a, a hope for the distant future. If you imagine that the future robots are extremely smart and their computers are very smart, um, even they will have to be very patient to get to the nearest nearby star. I don't know how fast they can go, but it's, uh, it's going to be a long trip. So that's my idea of what is in our future for robots. So let's stop and have time for a few questions. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Mether, for that fascinating lecture. Can I invite Mr. Christopher Lake to moderate the Q&A, please? All right, thank you very much, Dr. Mather. I think we have about uh, 15 minutes uh, to take questions from the audience. Uh, can I maybe invite uh, any of you here who want to ask questions to, to kick off? And yeah, okay, we have a gentleman there. Oh, Please, hello. Yeah. Uh, good, good morning, or maybe good evening. Uh, I do physics, but not astrophysics, as a disclaimer. Uh, my, my question has to do with a project itself. Uh, we know that these big, big projects involve lots of technologies from everywhere, and maybe advancements are constantly being made with potentially cut costs down by a lot, from what I understand. My question is that, uh, where is the point where you decide that the technologies that you have are enough and that you cannot wait any longer to obtain the result? Uh, Dr. Madden, well, did you <coughs> manage to catch that? Interesting question. It's a long discussion. <laughs> so uh, when we started off, we said we needed 10 different technologies to be perfected before we would be able to use them. So it took us about six years to prove that we knew how to do that. And then um, we could design the telescope around them. And then each one has to be proven again when you really build the flight equipment. So um, it's tricky, but it's every one of the technologies has to be requested and then developed. And so we, the way that we do it is we ask for people to propose how they would do it uh, then if the proposal is good, then we say, here's some money to prove that you can do that. And then they do it or not. And then eventually we have enough or we say we're ready. So uh, is there any point where you thought that it should be done later after launching the project? No, actually, uh, we knew that the project could be done. Uh, we did not know how long it would take. Uh, but we certainly knew there was an orderly process to get to the end. Yeah, I appreciate the answers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, maybe if I can invite the next question from over there. Uh, thanks, Joel. Uh, I'm Devo Chuti from National Center for Radio Astrophysics uh, of TIFR, India. So my question is uh, related to the, uh, uh, the WAVE's uh, capability for uh, observing very cool stars. So, uh, and most of the exoplanets are actually found close to the brown uh, M dwarf stars. And so what the wave can uh, be, uh, make this uh, into the future? Ah, okay. Well, Webb will be observing them with this transit technique that I showed you. Um, and we have uh, coverage of all wavelengths uh, from uh, 0.6 micrometers out to 28. So it depends on what the planets have to show us. We're just at the beginning of understanding this. So it's a difficult observation. Uh, we already know when we can uh, observe large planets, but not the small ones. We know they're there. We just don't know what we're going to find. Thank you. Maybe if I can just take a question that's been posted online from Slido as well. Let me see if I can uh, move it up on screen. Uh, can you see it? Ah, okay, great. Uh, maybe we can take the first question on top. Uh, in the book, uh, The Road to Reality, as uh, so Penrose emphasizes symmetry, uh, a seemingly dominant phenomenon of our universe. Uh, and you know, the, the uh, person who asked the question asked if you can comment further on this idea. Uh, Dr. Matter, are you? Ah, okay. Well, symmetry is indeed an important principle of our physical universe. Um, when we discover a symmetry, it usually means that there is a, a, a something that is preserved, a conserved quantity to physicists. So, for instance, uh, if uh, energy is conserved, it means that uh, the laws of nature are unchanged when you change the amount of time that you have. Um, 
So, and uh, other symmetries are also important. So we've found out amazing things from studying symmetry and we look for whatever it is that's being conserved. So we also find that uh, when uh, some symmetries are broken, that we get very interesting results. So it's thought as an example that the uh, early universe was filled with a cosmo, a, a thing called the inflation field, and that it was spontaneously broke its symmetry and turned itself into uh, the, the particles of matter that we see today. Thank you. Uh, maybe we can take one more question from Sayudu before we move on uh, to the folks here in the audience. So the second question, uh, how do you test on Earth if the telescope uh, can function as desired in outer space? I mean, sure, I'm sure there'll be uh, lots of challenges in trying to mimic you know, the environment that you have in yes. space here on Earth. Oh my that was indeed uh, one of the hardest things to do. Um, so we can't simulate zero gravity, but we can simulate the temperature and we can simulate the vacuum and we can simulate the uh, vibrations and acoustics uh, of the launch vehicle so all of those are pretty well known um, but it's very difficult to make a big enough vacuum tank and to cool it down so, but we have them we just have to go through the effort of building them and uh, testing them so it's uh, we do our very best to test the observatory as it will be in outer space Okay, maybe we can now move to the, the gentleman right at the back uh, in the blue <laughs> shorts. Yeah. Yes, hello. Thank Please. you. Very, thank you very much, John. That was super fascinating. So I have uh, three questions, to, so I try to make uh, each of one short. So the first one is also about technology. So I mean, computers, detectors have evolved a lot, I guess, over these 27 years. So how different is the telescope as it is now from what you had initially, let's say, planned or dreamed of? Second question is, I guess, I mean, there were many critical moments and obstacles on the way. So how did you dealt with these problems? Did you have sleepless nights where you thought like you couldn't solve a certain problem? And the third one is quite simple. Uh, how nervous were you when the telescope was launched or were you simply confident because you had tested it so much in, let's say, wow. simulations and on Earth? <laughs> OK, well, OK, I'll try to remember the questions. Uh, so there you go. The telescope that we flew is almost exactly what we asked for and 25 years ago. Um, we drew drawings on the big whiteboard and we knew the basic features that we had to have. It had to unfold in space. It had to have a big uh, sunshade to stay cold. And had, we knew where we had to put it in outer space around the Lagrange point too. Uh, and then there was a choice of how exactly are we going to fold it up and what will the mirrors be made of? Um, but the general idea is almost exactly as we thought about it 25 years ago. So that was really lovely. Uh, we didn't have to change our minds. And the reason we didn't have to change our minds was the original argument and the original requirement from the astronomers when demanded this solution. So were there any tough moments? Of course. Um, but I never worried that we wouldn't find an answer. Uh, when we have a team of the best people you can possibly find in the entire planet to work on this project. Well, I just have confidence they're going to solve the problem. So it's not me that has to solve the problem. It's a team that has to solve the problem. And so that meant that uh, when it came to launch day, I was very calm. I said, we have done everything we should do to make sure this project will work. And I knew quite well that it could be wrong, uh, but we had done everything that we could do and should do to make sure it would work. Thank you. <laughs> right. Uh, I, I want to make sure that everyone has a chance to ask your, your question. So if I can ask, if you can just keep it to one question and yeah. keep it to a short one. So maybe yeah. you next. Sure. Yeah. Hello, Dr. Maida. Thanks for the wonderful talk. Uh, now that Web is finally in the space and we have useful data already, I was hoping to know your thoughts on the next few decades of space observation. Do you think orbit-based orbit observ instruments are scalable or do you think lunar surface uh, base instruments of the future, besides the cost and engineering challenges, of course. Thank you. Okay, well, um, this isn't, of course, the last observatory we're building. Um, uh, Europe is launching a mission called Euclid this year uh, to uh, look for the dark matter and the dark energy or, or evidence of them and survey a lot of the sky. Um, the uh, Drea Rubin Observatory is going to be operational in South America, in Chile, 
uh, to uh, observe things that change every night. They'll survey the entire sky every three nights. Uh, and they expect to see 10 million changes every night. So that will be very interesting. We need 10 million graduate students every night. <laughs> uh, and then we will be launching the uh, Nancy Grace Roman telescope from NASA in about five years. And that will survey the sky and look again for dark matter and dark energy and also uh, for um, exoplanets. We have a, an instrument called a coronagraph on board to hunt for them. Then what happens after that? Um, uh, the National Academy of Sciences has requested that we build another telescope as large as the web, but more accurate. So then it would be able to actually make an image of an Earth-like planet orbiting a star like the sun. And that's essential for telling whether there could be life elsewhere in the universe. We have only one example of life. It's right here. And so find another example of something like this is a good idea. It's just extremely difficult, but we think we can do it. So maybe 20 years from now, we might have such an observatory. Thank you. And maybe this gentleman here. Yeah, thank you very much. My question is on uh, collaboration versus competition in, in space discovery, uh, where the Cold War has historically been catalyzing <coughs> space exploration. And then on the other side, NASA is extremely collaborative. You've talked about 20,000 people on the project. And these days, we see both uh, war climate, but also more industrial exploration, SpaceX, uh, origin, Blue Origin. And do you feel one collaboration is better than competition, or do both foster the space exploration? Uh, well, of course, we do both. Um, uh, each organization has collaboration within it. Um, and then uh, organizations compete with one another to get NASA contracts. So we say we need a rocket. And SpaceX sends us a proposal, and Boeing or United Launch Alliance sends us a proposal, and uh, Blue Origin sends us a proposal. Uh, and um, we don't usually buy from other countries, but other countries make rockets. So that's a very competitive world of building rockets. Um, so um, when NASA wants to go to the moon, we say, OK, we will build our own. Uh, but even that is built by a contractor. NASA, NASA scientists and engineers are not doing that. We hire a company to do that. And again, but by competition. Uh, so anyway, then. Um, so your question about competition and collaboration depends on the scale of what we're doing. And could you comment on events like uh, Russia exiting the ISS program? <laughs> yeah, well, I don't actually have much knowledge about the details, but um, we know, of course, that there's another way to go now that the uh, SpaceX can go and take people up and down. And the uh, Boeing uh, spaceship is about ready to go, too. So uh, we don't have to collaborate with them. On, so I'm sorry to see them go. But of course, there are forces larger than NASA at work here. Thank you for your answer. So unfortunately, I think we only have time for perhaps one more question. Uh, so maybe the gentleman in front has been waiting. Uh, thank you for this informative talk. So I am Nilkant from India. So my question is that what are your thoughts on the role of quantum technology in future space exploration programs? Oh, well, it's certainly very interesting. Of course, uh, everything we do is quantum mechanical. We just don't talk about it. Every photon you receive is a quantum. Um, but uh, where it gets interesting is uh, the possibility that maybe their entangled photons would be useful in some way besides encryption. So people are writing papers about it. Uh, I don't know whether it could work uh, in a practical sense, but it's worth talking about. Thank you. Some smart person will figure this out. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Matter. I think uh, we are running out of time, so I'm going to quickly wrap it up. Uh, I think I just want to thank you on behalf of the organizers for taking the time to speak to us. Uh, and I'm sure I speak on behalf of the audience when I say that you know, the presentation has been most fascinating. So thank you very much, Dr. Matter. Thank you once again, Dr. Matter. And Mr. Lake for moderating that session.
So our next speaker coming up is Professor Barry Marshall. He is the winner of the 2005 Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine. He will be talking about how bad luck, incompetence and fraud delayed a discovery by 100 years. So we'll listen to that and then the Q&A session will be moderated by Professor Chris Sham. Professor Marshall, please. We're just trying to establish the connection online, so just give us a moment, please.
Hi, Prof. Marshall. Welcome to the GYSS. Thank you. Yep. If you're settled in, you can take it away. Thank you. Oh, I'm going to start talking now, giving a lecture. Hi. Um, <laughs> welcome, everybody, to GYSS. So this lecture, uh, I think it's I'm still working on it. It's not final yet because... I'm on holidays and uh, I had so much security issues with my mail over the last uh, week or so that I couldn't really work on it easily. And I was out of town, et cetera, because summer here, of course, in Perth and uh, everybody wants to get, wants me to go to the beach or do things like that with the family. So, um, but uh, this is a lecture about the history of helicobacter. And I often wondered how come, people didn't discover it i mean when you've got a bacteria which infects more than half of the people in the world how come it wasn't discovered and uh so that's the kind of the story and then i'll talk to you about some recent stuff that's going on about um you know people who fake their data and change things in their results and everything so I, I just want everyone in gys to be aware of some of the issues that we have now and uh, perhaps uh, help me solve some of these problems as they develop. So let's see how we go. So this is how bad luck, incompetence and fraud delayed a discovery by a hundred years. And that's the discovery of Helicobacter pylori and Dr. Warren and I won that uh, Nobel prize in 2005 for physiology and medicine. And that, the Nobel prize, as you remember, are usually given uh, the announcements usually in October. So that's an important date for us. Now, let's just see if I can make it work. Okay, yeah. So Warren and I um, were looking around in the books once we saw these bacteria in the stomach. We found out that they were already discovered and we went and, and saw them uh, in history books and veterinary books. And ultimately, I published a book on it called Helicobacter Pioneers. And you'll see there that uh, we've got 1892 was Bizozero in Turin, Italy. And then the Japanese 1917, Friedberg in America, Fitzgerald in UK, Sasa, Leva, Ito, Morozov in Russia, Steer in England, Ramsey in Texas, Phillips, Yao. So... As it got towards the um, 70s and up to the, the 80s uh, with various discoveries, these people almost discovered H. pylori at the same time as us, maybe kind of a few years before, but didn't ca carry on with the research. So it was a bit of a puzzle to me. They, they were a bit unlucky, really. Um, and so uh, we can think about why these things happen and how they happen. And I'll tell you about some of those interesting discoveries. So here's uh, Dr. Warren and I, and this photo was taken probably 1983, 1984 at Royal Perth Hospital. And you see that uh, in those days, <laughs> I had a moustache because I needed to look older. But now that I am older, I cut the moustache off so that I can look younger. And of course, Dr. Warren still lives in Perth. He's retired and uh, we get together uh, from time to time and look at slides and things like that and have a few beers. Um, so when we first uh, presented our paper, we got this letter back from the um, conference that we submitted it to in 1983. They said, Dr. Marshall, I regret your research paper was not accepted for presentation. The number of abstracts we received continues to increase for this meeting. 67 were submitted and we could only accept 56. So our paper was in the bottom 20%. And you see, I suppose uh, I'm just going to change my uh, pointer to a laser pointer, I think. Uh, no, I can't change it. I'll have to keep clicking. OK, so um, people just didn't know anything about bacteria in the stomach, so you couldn't get peer review on your papers. And uh, our paper was not very interesting as far as the gastroenterologists were concerned. So, of course, I was very sad about that for a few days uh and then my boss said to me hey I, there's an international meeting in in europe why don't you go to that and uh, they accepted it and uh, things took off from there so it was very interesting for us 
So there were four clues in the history to H. pylori, spiral bacteria in the stomach, epidemic hypochlorhydria, gastric urease, and antibacterial therapy for gastric disease. So if you knew all this literature at once, uh, you would say, uh, obviously, um, it's uh, a bacteria that's, that's a problem here. But people, this literature was in different places at different times. And nowadays, you can hopefully find it uh, by doing a good uh, PubMed search. But, you know, the electronic media, the electronic um, means of doing research really only started in the 70s when the Internet started up and the, the, the um, computerization got big enough to hold uh, databases and indexes and things. So if it's something that happened before about 1970, it's probably not you probably will never find it. And you need to go to the, the library and look at those moldy old books down in the basement. Uh, and I, I collect these old medical books about ulcers and things. And I can tell you a lot of uh, interesting stuff uh, happened before Google was even invented. So spiral bacteria in the stomach was seen in 1992 by Giulio Bizzosero in Turin, Italy, a, quite a famous anatomist. And... Uh, he found that even red cells have nucleated precursors in the marrow because everyone used to say it's not nuclear, not important to have a nucleus in a cell. What about those red cells? There are millions of them, no nucleus. But he showed that they came from nucleated cells. So that was his important discovery. But uh, actually, he had other discoveries as well. And he said, hey, um, acid-tolerant spirochetes live in the dog stomach. So he was uh, looking at the anatomy of the dog stomach and seeing these spirochetes in there. Now, here's his pictures from his thesis. And you'll see, look, go uh, these spiral bacteria. And we now know that this kind of uh, helicobacter lives in cats and dogs. Uh, lots of them have it. And you shouldn't let your dog lick you on the mouth because you can catch the dog helicobacter and get quite a sick stomach over many, many years. So uh, that was Bizosero. And that's more than 100 years ago now. And then in Japan, um, Kitazato. He, the Kitazato Institute in Tokyo, actually, they had quite a lot of uh, really great uh, infectious disease research. I think cholera, shigella, I can't remember what other bacteria they discovered there. Uh, Robert Koch, he was uh, one of the ones who discovered tuberculosis, remember? Kitazato studied in his uh, laboratory and then Kosei... Ko started the institute, Kasai and Kobayashi studied gastro, gastric spirochetes. And so they knew the bacteria lived in the stomach. Here's Dr. Kobayashi. And he used some of the treatment that people were using for syphilis, which is another spiral bacteria. And he uh, was giving salvarsan, which is syphilis treatment to these different mice. And he's measuring, uh, you see the mouse numbers there the dilution of the cell arsen, and if it's one in 300 and he gave it to the mice, all those spirochetes disappeared. So, uh, you know, if he was looking for human ulcers and saw the helicobacter in those days, he would have had a treatment probably which could cure helicobacter and cure ulcers 100 years before. So um, we can say from that that uh, it's present in cats and dogs and monkeys, and actually monkeys have the human one, helicobacter pylori not in all animals, susceptible cell arsen. And uh, he was showing that in some funny animal models, he could have gastric hemorrhagic erosions. So, of course, what was happening about that time was World War I. There was so much crazy stuff happening, the Japanese-Russian War, et cetera, that, uh, you know, obviously the government was not going to fund that kind of research. Now, let's move on a bit. 1940. Uh, Friedberg and Barron published this paper in the United States from Boston, from Harvard. And here you see Stone Friedberg, and that's when he was a, a young man. He was a cardiologist in the in the 50s, I suppose, when that was done. This is the middle picture is when I met him, and he was about in his 80s. And when he turned 100, he had an article in the New York Times showing uh, some of his papers where he described the spirochetes in the human gastric mucosa. And uh, he was very interested in going on with this work. But of course, 1940, that again, not a good year for medical research. 1941 was Pearl Harbor, World War II, 
all kinds of crazy things were happening and a lot of important discoveries like insulin, um, cardiac surgery, I suppose, you know. So he became a cardiologist in the end and he worked at Harvard all his life. But this was pretty famous stuff and he always thought that was important, but nobody else did and it, he never went on with that work and actually changed specialty in the end. So here's a picture from his paper and you see the curved bacteria. It's an old document by now, of course, had several photocopies, but these are obviously helicobacter. And 46% of people who had their stomach resected because of ulcers or stomach problems had these bacteria and using his methods. So that was, he was kind of trying to get people to get interested in this. So he um, told, maybe presented it at a meeting. One of the people who was at that meeting was this guy, Eddie Palmer, and he was chief of medicine and gastroenterology at Walter Reed Hospital. Now, I don't know whether you know about Walter Reed Hospital. It was, you know, the world's top army hospital in Washington, D.C. I'm not sure whether it's still there. Maybe they knocked it down. But uh, it was there when I was in America 20 years ago. So Palmer, he had his uh, people. He, I don't think he did this research himself. Uh, but he asked someone in his lab, hey, check out those biopsies that we have uh, fixed there and see if you can find any of those spiral bacteria that are discussed by Friedberg. Anyway, they couldn't find it. And th this is, the, this is the, their paper. None of the 1,180 specimens was found to contain uh, spirochetes or any structure which could be a spirochete. And uh, so they said... Um, it's just a normal commensal of the mouth. And when the stomach gets carcinoma or ulcer, the spirochetes are retained and otherwise encouraged to remain at the diseased area during life. So he's saying if, if they really did exist, then people with ulcers must have something wrong with them and the bacteria just come along afterwards. It's just the same as the bacteria that were in your mouth. And most people thought, thought this. If they ever saw them, they didn't bother to do any investigation. So, oh, yeah, those spirochetes, we know about those. Uh, but didn't really examine them. So, karma. But if they didn't see it in more than a thousand specimens, it means they didn't actually do the research. So, someone in his lab was faking it. I think, I don't think they did it. I think they just pretended to and just put negative, negative, negative down the whole lot of them. And maybe they didn't have a good stain or maybe they had a bad microscope. Who knows? But when they presented it to, to Palmer and he was so famous, Everyone else said, oh, end of story. And that was the end of it pretty much in the United States. So that was incompetent research or straight out fraud. And some, I don't know, research fellow said, or registrar, medical doctor probably in the lab said, oh, this is, I need to go down to the beach. I need a holiday or something. And it, he just faked the data. So because of that, Probably Helicobacter was not discovered in the 1950s. And uh, that was lucky for Dr. Warren and I because uh, we, we took up on it. So here's something about Edward Palmer. If his CV is in his obituary, and he, he, he died at age 91 um, in California, I think. But here you see he was uh, one of the top army people. He was in Munich in Germany and after the war. Then he was Walter Reed Army Hospital. He was a director there. And then, you know, he went all over the place in the United States, Surgeon General, got consulted to the Surgeon General, so totally famous. So nobody would want to question his opinion about the bacteria, would they? Um, and maybe someone should have. So that's just a warning to you, just because you're just a junior researcher. Uh, people like me aren't always correct, and we might not have done the research properly. Uh, here's a bit of uh, his contemporaneous history. There's me on the right-hand side when I was a kid living in Carnarvon and my grandfather's there. This is the whaling station. That's a humpback whale. There I am sitting on the lip. I'm worried a bit. I look a bit worried, actually. So uh, that's the era where I came on the scene uh, about the same time as Palmer was cancelling the idea of bacteria in the stomach. And his is Perth and uh, Singapore there and, and Carnarvon is just there in the middle of Western Australia. So it's a great place to go and see whales. They're all over the place these days because they nearly got wiped out and they came back. So the other person at Harvard was Susumu Ito, 
Handbook of Physiology 1997, and this is his electron micrograph of what he called it was a spirillum. Now, he was studying the anatomy. He had the, one of the first electron microscopes. I'm going to a sip of water here. And he was studying uh, the anatomy of the stomach, and he had beautiful preparations of cat stomachs because, of course, you can euthanize the cat straight away put it in uh, the fixative and you get beautiful images for electron microscopy and you can see this is a helicobacter pylori this is a couple of flagella at one end and all the things we want to know so how did he get this great photograph well one day he says thinking i wonder if humans have bacteria in their stomach like cats so he had a a, 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 a suction biopsy it was so it's like a bicycle brake cable with a little uh, micro, a little uh, guillotine on the end and a suction and everything so he passed it on himself he swallowed it down into his stomach and he you know sucked on it took a biopsy took the biopsy out. so he had a fresh biopsy from his own stomach and he processed it in electron microscopy and there he is publishing this picture in this famous book handbook of physiology now he then said well humans of cats have all got them no problem humans have got them as well. They're just commensal bacteria of the stomach. And again, put everyone just went to sleep on the whole idea. But here's the mistake. So I, I said, you know, we what did we say is fraud and uh, incompetence or bad luck. So this is kind of bad luck. But he didn't know that these bacteria, Helicobacter pylori, infected nearly everybody in Japan. So anyone who's Japanese had them. And even now, about 30% of Japanese still have them. 50% of Chinese and 50% of the whole world. So he did an experiment on himself, you see, and it was, there were no controls. He didn't have enough people in his series. And on the basis of one case, which was himself, he wrote about these bacteria and he was totally wrong because they were pathogens and everybody had them or so many people had them. And it was not exactly the same as the cat one, which is mostly a commensal. So Susumu Itu is a very nice fellow. Uh, he's passed away now, but he and I uh, had a big meeting in Harvard Medical School many years ago, and he gave me a lot of his electron micrographs so that the faculty at Harvard, you can't trust them. They were just going to throw out all these papers. So I got them all so I can show him his original ones. And he was famous. He was in the war in the Japanese regiment in 1945, uh, fighting against the Japanese or the Germans. And the story I heard was that whenever there was a battle to be won and probably no, probably they were going to lose, they would send the Japanese uh, regiment into it. So they all uh, got all kinds of medals and things for winning. So if you survived the war, you were always a hero. So he went to Harvard Medical School after that. Um, so, OK, move on a few years. Howard Steer, 1975, he's a young surgical registrar in England. Colin Jones is a gastroenterologist, and they started studying biopsies from ulcers. And they're looking at it pretty carefully under the microscope, and they thought they saw some little spots here and there, and they labeled them B. So if you look at this cell here, you'll see these black spots, B, 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 there. And again, it's some curved ones here, and polymorphs, PNL, uh, eosinophils so they were looking at inflammation in gastric ulcer patients and they were treating their ulcers seeing what happened and they saw bacteria so what went wrong well this is a beautiful electron micrograph and this was published after warren and i announced announced our discovery so this was kind of already impressed electron micrograph of these bacteria you can see the helicobacter beautiful picture so what went wrong well, actually, he wanted to do a thesis uh, on these bacteria, but his uh, thesis application was rejected. And so he went off and did uh, some surgery or something after that. And he had a microbiologist who wasn't very good. And he said, did some analysis. He couldn't grow helicobacter, of course, and all he grew was pseudomonas. So pseudomonas are curved bacteria about the same size. He says, oh, this is just pseudomonas. You know, they grow in the channel of the endoscope. This is a contamination. Don't worry about them. They grow all kinds of, in all kinds of places. So pseudomonas, uh, and every again, everyone went to sleep on it. So poor Dr. Steer, he uh, could have discovered helicobacter and came very, very close. Uh, so it's a bit sad that he didn't do it. 
So the next one's epidemic hypochlorhydria. How am I going for time? Better hurry up a bit. So in the olden days, William Osler, who published uh, a lot of medical books, very famous in England and England and Canada, um, he used to go around and study children who see so he would do his general practice rounds or his physician rounds. I'm not sure I understand. Oops, my watch is giving me messages. Um, so William Osler used to see children who were vomiting and he used to ask the mother to just save a bit of the vomit and he would test it with litmus paper and you say some of these kids haven't got any acid in the stomach and for volatile fatty acids that's anaerobic bacteria so he had diagnosed this acute problem in children where they vomited for a few days there was no acid in the vomit and he called it achlorhydric gastritis it was very common we now know uh, in retrospect, that that is the acute infection of Helicobacter. So, if ever any of your any of you people have children, and uh, the children are vomiting, as a, you know, young children under the age of five, it's worthwhile to put some litmus paper in the vomit. If there's no acid in the vomit, well, then it could be Helicobacter. So, a few years later, actually 1978, when they're studying new high tech uh, ulcer drugs and uh, all kinds of things doing studying volunteers and acid secretion in texas in dallas which is which was the uh you know uh i guess the the palace of acid studies and the top gastroenterology place in the united states at the time they had an epidemic of gastritis with low acidity uh in about 30 people and uh, these people were having gastric, these volunteers, medical students and different people were having gastric tests. And they suddenly all started vomiting and had gastritis and there was no acid. Uh, and they did not look under normal, you know, they didn't have proper methods for studying it. And they assumed that it was a virus or something, but they didn't discover the helicobacter. In retrospect, it was helicobacter. And that's a cute uh, thing. So to show people that helicobacter could be the problem here, I did some animal experiments which didn't work. So I decided to drink the bacteria myself. And here I am, just like this. But I, but I swigged it down and it was a, a, a brew from two culture plates. And we published that in actually 1985. Not known. I did the experiment in 1984. Dr. Warren's there. He says, Marshall, your stomach is dangerously inflamed. So after a few days, <coughs> I got quite unwell and was vomiting and no acid in the vomit. And so that rang a bell with me because I'd seen those other old reports. And uh, so this is my gastric biopsy eight days after drinking helicobacter. We've now done lots of volunteers to, with helicobacters. People are working on vaccines, et cetera. And this is typically what you see after day eight. And then it goes on to a chronic infection and the symptoms go away and the person may be seen perfectly well, might have vague stomach discomfort, but, uh, you know, may or may not develop an ulcer. So the other interesting bit of research was gastric urease and people were studying the enzymes in the stomach because, you know, you have digestive juices. And uh, the problem is... Um, if you eat a steak, a piece of meat, it gets digested in your stomach, and yet your stomach is made out of meat. So how can you possibly, how can you reconcile these things? So obviously the stomach's got some kind of mechanism, and people were looking at the enzymes, protease. One of the ones they found was urease. And where does that come from? So uh, one of the people who did a thesis on it was this guy, Oliver Fitzgerald, in Ireland, and with his friend Murphy, and they studied the physiological chemistry and significance of urease. And the idea was they could feed people urea and instead of, let's say, an acid blocker, and the urease would create ammonia from the urea, and then that would neutralize the acid, maybe heal ulcers. That was their thought about it. Now, Fitzgerald became the president of the British Medical Gastroenterology Society in about 1980 and then he passed away before I could meet him but I did meet his wife uh, and she was uh, showing me his papers uh, so there he is Oliver Fitzgerald president of British Society of Gastro he's quite a famous guy 
uh, and uh, he did a thesis, but he didn't know it was caused by bacteria. He thought the stomach was making the uh, urease enzyme. You know, this guy, Charles Lieber, he was Belgian and he eventually went to uh, New York and was working at SUNY in Long Island, I think. And he was, uh, I think he was a gastroenterologist and he was studying the stomach. And what he noticed was that on the um, y-axis, you've got the amount of uh, the type of nitrogen that he's finding in the gastric juice. And on the bottom, you can see different secretions. And firstly, he looks at the urea before oxytetracycline. So he's got a control group and then he treated them with antibiotics. So before treatment, you'll see most of the nitrogen is urea and a little bit is ammonia. Hang on, my mistake. Uh, you see the white square is ammonia. So in his volunteers, most of the urea or the nitrogen that was in the stomach was ammonia and only a little bit was urea. But if he gave these people an antibiotic, oxytetracycline, look what happened. Now, most of the nitrogen in the stomach is urea and not ammonia, only a little bit of ammonia. So he showed that, hey, antibiotics stop the urease from working. Why is that? Uh, so a bit of a puzzle there. Um, so anyway, at that point, you could say, okay, the urease in the stomach is coming from a bacteria. There must be bacteria there. You can eradicate it with tetracycline. So again, an opportunity in the 70s to discover Helicobacter, which was missed. And so he is, he is also passed away, but I did meet him and talk with him. And then finally, antibacterial therapy for gastric disease. Um, now, here it is. Uh, so 100 years ago, Procter & Gamble, one of the world's largest uh, multinational companies, makes soap powder and uh, uh, dandruff shampoo, the free and lovely, things like that. But they bought a company, Norwich Eaton, which had this product called Bismocell, which ultimately became Pepto-Bismol. And in their literature from 100 years ago, they said in conjunction with other remedies, it's been found good to treat gastritis and as well as acute gastritis. Bismocell, they called it. That was bismuth. Now, remember Kobayashi? He was treating um, this mouse spirochetes with arseminol. So arsenic and bismuth are in the same column in the table of elements. So bismuth is a heavy metal, often used in the olden days for me medicine, uh, for infectious uh, things, uh, even used to treat syphilis and was still available, really still is available in some patent medicines. And uh, so heavy metals, I discovered, kill spiral bacteria. So that's another story, but you know, I got some patents on that very early on and that helped me uh, bankroll my interesting medical career. I didn't have to have a private practice. I just stayed in research in hospitals because of that. But um, so, that there was this history of it treating gastritis. And I saw this, I said, you know, this must be an antibiotic. It must be good for Helicobacter. Uh, and then Kobayashi showed that it was similar to ars arsenic. So now if you go to America and actually England, you can buy Pepto-Bismol in the supermarket and everybody in America knows that coats the stomach and it helps Helicobacter. And if you have some kind of acute gastrointestinal upset, even traveler's diarrhea, you can take this stuff and just go get it in the supermarket, take some pills, take that medicine. And people were taking that and Procter & Gamble was selling more than $100 million worth of this per year. And they didn't know why it worked. And I called up Procter & Gamble and said, hey, listen, I think this stuff probably is going to cure ulcers. And, you know, uh, even today, this difficult to treat helicobacters. They still use bismuth and tetracycline, those old things. So really they could have, made that discovery 50 years ago at least uh, and missed out on it and the problem was a bit of bad luck but um, the issue was nobody thought that bacteria could live in the stomach and as I said the literature was widely separated so nobody picked up on it <laughs> um, one uh, Greek doctor started giving people antibiotics for ulcers <clears throat> and uh, he got a patent uh, he couldn't find a publisher and they deregistered him. They thought that's a such crazy treatment to give ulcer patients antibiotics. 
we're going to strike you off. And so the Greek uh, <laughs> establishment and medical uh, people struck him off and said, you can't practice. But thousands of people used to go to him in Athens and get, get cured of their ulcer probably. Uh, so, uh, and then also I'd say in, in China, uh, Helicobacter was almost discovered now. Uh, Dr. Shi, I don't, she, I don't think he, I'm not sure that uh, he's still alive. He might be, but in his PhD, he described bacteria and people in ulcers. Uh, people in China used to give antibiotics for ulcers. They thought there was something wrong with uh, some infection in the gut. They didn't really know. Uh, and they used to treat with antibiotics and get good results in some, some cases. And him and uh, Dr. Xiao Shidong, who's also passed away in Shanghai, they gave a uh, did a trial where they gave people uh, metronidazole and it seemed to really help. Um, so anyway, here's another one. Uh, Chinese literature, 1975. If after 14 days of antibiotics, the elevation of the ulcer margin is less, then the ulcer is probably benign. So they do a barium, give antibiotics, and they could show that ulcers were healing, I think. But again, it was a bit haphazard. So now I'm going to talk about you know, fraud and uh, stuff like that in um, medicine and in research. So I'm going to show you an actual thing that happened in my lab a few years back, and we were doing lots of mouse experiments. And I'm just going to be vague about it. So I call this slide getting to 0.05. So you want to do an experiment. If your theory is right, you should get something happening. The test mice will be different from the controls. Uh, and you get a p-value and you get a publication. And if you don't get a p-value, it's hard to get it published. You know that. So here's a mouse experiment with 10 controls and 11 test mice. And the mice are just along the x-axis, numbered 1, 2, 3, up to 21. And here is some kind of immunologic experiment with some numbers here. And this could be counts of cells or it could be antibody titus. Who knows? Um, so if we look at that study, here we are, we've got 21 mice. So we've got 10 mice here in the green box. They're the controls. They did not get any helicobacter. And then these other ones on the right are the test mice, and they did get helicobacter. But, you know, here's, there's quite a bit of overlap between these two gro groups. So we'd want to do some statistics on that, see if they're different. We Maybe we do a chi-squared, a t-test, I don't know. Not really. I'm not really a great statistician. So, uh, so some of the controls in this study are high, and we said that they're outliers. We, you know, they're some kind of funny outliers. These are supposed to be inbred mice. They might be Belbsi mice. They're supposed to be all identical. So, the fact that you've got you know spots all over the place when all these mice got the same treatment is a bit hard to explain so it means it's a bad experiment i think there's something that's different about these mice and and the bottom ones anyway so if you look at it you say well you know these these uh inflammation mice um helicobacter mice they, they seem to be a bit higher is it significant we do the test the p value is greater than 0.05 it's 0.06 okay so anyway, the poor lab tech feels that he, he or she's done a bad experiment. And here's the issue. People have invested millions of dollars in a startup company trying to develop a new treatment for ulcers. And uh, lo and behold, this data comes out. Um, it's not significant. So they stop funding it. And everybody in the company is fired. Go and do something else. So at Christmas time, they all lose their jobs, including the lab tech who's going to be who did this experiment. So guess what the lab tech did? The lab tech moved the outliers down a tiny bit. Oops, I'm going back there. Okay. So what about if we? I'm not sure whether I can go back and forwards. Yeah, you watch. You watch this. This dot here. We replaced it with one that's moved down a little bit. And now the p-value is 0.045. It's significant. So that was the report that came out. We did actually notice that the Excel spreadsheet had different numbers in it and the graph was not quite right. 
so uh, that person uh, lost their job and did not get a good reference from us, didn't get any reference at all. And so that's the sort of thing that can happen. Uh, what seems like a tiny little change can actually result in millions of dollars wasted and a whole research program can go bad. Now, I can tell you that I have a, a, a tweet, a Twitter. It's called at Barjammer. You can search for me, Barry Marshall. It's pretty easy. You can find a few comments there. I don't blog very much. But one of my contacts uh, through Twitter is a very famous person now called Elizabeth Bick. And she's got at Microbiome Digest. And here she is. She has got software and actually a pretty sharp eyes. And she started finding fake images in uh, publications, even in nature and science. So, of course, she started with the top journals and she was finding fake images in people's papers. And so she was telling me about this. And I said, well, that's pretty interesting. So I started reading up on this as well. And you should follow this woman, Elizabeth Bick. It's very, very interesting how many fake papers there are. And people will say, oh, well, that's just junior, junior people. You know, they're just going to go off and become, I don't know, bus conductors or something. But uh, it's not very important. It's just their thesis. However, these things can build. And you might become like Eddie Palmer, chief of medicine somewhere or advising the president. And then they find out, oh, no, you've got fake images in your paper that you did 20 years ago. And I'll show you some examples of that. So one that's right now, Alzheimer's drug saga prompts journal to scrutinize whistleblowers. So this is one that uh, people know about where a receptor, uh, images of a new kind of receptor was perhaps faked in these papers. Uh, millions of paper, millions of dollars have been spent, research companies, stock market, all that kind of stuff, and is based on a bit of fake data. So everyone's pretty cranky about that in the United States. It's this paper, 67 citations. It's about seven years old now, or 10, maybe even 10 years from the original paper. 20 millions of NIH funding on other investigators. So other people started doing this research and got funded by NIH. A startup company with a paper value of millions and share price of $135 uh, now because they've blown the whistle on them. Now it's gone down to 25. So some people in the company still think it's true, but others say, well, there's no evidence actually because they've faked it. So now short sellers. So these people are betting on the fact that this company is going to go bankrupt. They're blowing the whistle and searching through all their papers. And they're finding numerous faked papers by these authors. So, you know, it's now the FBI is investigating. Look, I've got a typo. Um, so in the United States, if you have federal government grants and you've got some faked data and you get some money, you are in big trouble. And certainly people are going have been going to jail in the United States over the years from that. Uh, and the university gets struck off, they can't publish and uh, they get a bad reputation. Um, I'm going to show you now a, a PDF. I'm going to just uh, share my uh, other document. So this is all very well. I'm uh, going to show you uh, a shared screen of it happened to me. I mean, I didn't fake it, but somebody just copied my paper. And so uh, I can show you this. I think it's sharing now. Yes. Okay. So I suppose this is going to work. Yeah. And so here's a here's my 1985 paper, and it shows you some Helicobacter there cultures, and here's a culture of the Helicobacter that we got from a patient with an ulcer. So that's all very well. And then in 2012, these people published a paper. Um, Detection of cultivable, hel cultivable helicobacter in wastewater treatment plants, uh, in published in a good journal, Helicobacter. And then I looked at their image, and guess what? It's the same as this one. They reckon this is from wastewater in Spain. And I'm saying, no, it's not. It's a copy taken off the internet of my 1985 paper, and you published it in 2012. And I looked, you know, you can see the little spots. These random spots don't occur identically unless you've just copied it. So lots of people are doing this kind of uh, thing. Um, 
So I'm just probably going to finish off there. I had more material and I know that um, my uh, review, my boss uh, probably wants me to stop sharing now and uh, finish off. And so uh, I had one more slide. How are we going for time? I think I'm just about running over time, 12.30. Actually, I've got about 15 more minutes, but I just want to show you... Um, uh, my final slides. So I'll share screen once more and I'm going to share screen my PowerPoint again. There it is. There. And um, so, okay. So uh, I don't know where that comes from. We had a conference in Perth in 1982 when it was 20 years after the discovery of Helicobacter. And I can tell you that next year, we're going to have another one. So this is the one in 1982. We talked about good and bad helicobacter. We had a, co a nice conference in Perth. And uh, so don't worry, you can have another conference in Perth in 1984, which is 40 years uh, since my first uh, publication uh, in The Lancet with Dr. Warren. So mark your calendar, October 2024. It's actually probably going to be in Nobel Prize Announcement Week, so we we'll have lots of interest there. And uh, we'll talk about the latest advances in Helicobacter. And Dr. Elizabeth Bick, the famous uh, detective on faked papers, is probably going to give a session there at that conference. So I think that's the end. Um, I'm not sure. Let's have a look. Uh, see you in Perth. That's called the CHRO meeting. And uh, we're just, if you wonder where Perth is, well, here's some of my family members, you know, just south of you guys in Singapore. Okay. I'm going to stop sharing now. It's getting a bit crazy. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Marshall. And I think everybody here has enjoyed that lecture tremendously. I'll just invite um, Professor Chris Shum to moderate some of the Q&A. All right, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Marshall, for the very insightful talk. So uh, maybe the gentleman right here uh, can, can ask the question. Hi, uh, it's great to like, see someone talk about research fraud, uh, especially in today's climate. So my question is really just based on some personal observations. So to me, it just seems like Australian institutes in general are very vigilant about research integrity and uh, and the ethics like uh, also like other things like bullying like we have the famous case of alan cooper i think dr elizabeth bick was also like at my university to talk about if i'm not wrong maybe two years ago uh, yep. so is it that australia is something different on on these issues that other countries are a bit more hush hush about or am i just biased in my anecdotal observations so <laughs> In Australia, there are the top line, top echelon university called the Group of Eight, and these are research-oriented uh, universities and in the top 100 in the world. So those universities usually have, if you like, um, research police. And so not only the students, but also the faculty get audited. And um, so therefore, a lot of times it'll be picked up, but you just remember these days, all the, all the thesis is going to be online for a PDF. If you pre republish one of the images out of your thesis and say it's a new data or something, and you know, all the um, reviewers are using the plagiarism detection software. So uh, it's very difficult. I'm, whenever I write a review article now, I'm, I'm wondering, is this plagiarism? And so the trick is, I'll tell you the students, the trick is, you read the article and say, I want to cite this article. So that's important. You do cite them and you read what the, the conclusion is and, and, you, and then you close that article. And you, in your own words, then you write what it means, what the, the message is. It's probably only a sentence or two about something. So-and-so found that uh, bacteria were present in chopsticks. It's not true, by the way, but that would be an interesting one. So uh, then... Uh, you know, there's very fancy plagiarism uh, software that will actually go and analyze the meaning and, and try to say it's plagiarism. So, so, you know, you've got to realize there is a limit. So in Australia, I think 
I don't know. It's probably just the, the tradition. You know, Australians are, are all descended from convicts, you see, so we've got a bad record. <laughs> we probably think we better not do anything. We'll definitely get caught. But I, but I love reading about uh, how, how people have caught. So um, one in the Queensland, for example, um, a, a student um, was studying the Great Barrier Reef and she published a paper saying that uh, too much nitrogen and fertiliser in the Great Barrier Reef is causing these poor little rainbow fish to have sex change and be hermaphroditic or something. And uh, then she published a picture of about 30 of these fish uh, in and, and all these little pictures of these fish. And someone looked at it and realised that this picture was photoshopped. She only had about five fish and she had turned someone, some of them upside down, inside out, you know, moved them, changed the magnification so that she had this illustration of 30 fish. So they went and spoke to her um, uh, colleagues in the lab and they said, well, these fish are quite rare and hard to find. And as far as we know, she only made one excursion out to the Barrier Reef. And so to find 30 of these fish in one day is just impossible. So I love those kinds of stories. So, of course, that person uh, has left academia and doesn't reply to emails when questioned about this. So this is usually what happens. Um, so it's, it's, it's a great uh, story. There's always... All kind, there are all kinds of terrible frauds going on. Um, and uh, I told, told you about mistakes as well, like Dr. Ito biopsying himself. And of course, doing your own self-experiment like I did is also not really science. It could be too subjective. So the fact that I felt unwell, I almost said, you know, everyone would say, oh, well, that's psychosomatic. You know, you just want to get a paper published. But I did have biopsies and the pathologist Dr. Warren and colleagues independently. So that's there's no inflammation now. There's terrible inflammation. So that inflammation was there. It all fitted together. Um, so, uh, but I'd encourage uh, students to be comfortable with statistics and understand the statistics. So you want to know what's the power of your investigation. And the problem is that we don't like to euthanize too many mice. And so don't use, don't kill the poor little mice. They're helping us just, just have, and the, the ethics committee on animals will say, well, why don't you just use 16 mice? Why do you have to use 25? You say, well, mice are unpredictable. Probably a couple will die and I want to get a tighter P value. So if, if there are 30 mice in that study, that, that, that might've been a significant result. So uh, it's a, a bit of a dilemma we have uh, at the moment. Um, if we got time, how much time have we got, uh, moderator? Uh, well, I, can, I think I can uh, invite the gentleman in the back. To ask okay, him. great. Thanks. Thank you. Um, hi, Professor. Thanks for the wonderful talk. So I want to ask you if maybe the issue might be that peer, the, our peer review process, the way it's conducted, is not robust enough. Because, you know, one thing that makes science good is that it's uh, self-correcting. And that self-correcting mechanism relies on the fact that experiments can be repeated and the uh, results can be verified. But the peer review uh, process doesn't include the repeating the experiments to see the results, obviously, because there isn't enough time for every peer reviewer to repeat experiments. Do you think maybe there's a way we can improve this? So um, in the helicobacter thing, you know, it was 10 years before real people said that's really true. So uh, we published in 84, 85, and 94, the NIH had a consensus conference said bacteria cause ulcers, end of story. Uh, and then uh, there was a few more years before we had a treatment. So another five years before we had a good treatment. So uh, what, what was happening in that time? Well, first thing is, I, as a, if you're a young researcher and you're thinking, uh, what, how does this all work? Well, you start off with a poster of your work. So after six months, you might have preliminary results. They say, well, this is exciting. What are these bacteria doing there? That kind of thing. So we did that in 1983. And I presented a, uh, you know, a little presentation or a presentation at a local meeting. And everybody said, we don't believe it. It's not true. Uh, all kinds of reasons. So I, I then went away from that very early situation. And I said, 
these people don't believe it for these five reasons. So I went one by one, we went through those five reasons and said, well, that didn't rule it out. This didn't rule it out. Uh, that, that was wrong. This teaching's wrong. You know, so we, a year later, we had that stage. And then we published a, um, you know, we had a letter somewhere in the Lancet. And then we had a poster presentation at an international meeting. So, you know, I had it rejected in Australia and it was an interesting poster at a microbiology meeting in Brussels. So then I could stand in front of my poster and argue it one on one with the world's top people at that point. And they walked, walked away saying, you know, there could be something in this. Now, I've got an interesting story about how it all got accepted in the Lancet eventually. It was my wife who got that through. But um, so they, they're interested in it. So, but no one does anything about it until they read it in an international journal from somebody who doesn't believe it. And so nobody believed it. The guys in Holland didn't believe it. And then they looked at their material and then, hey, it's true. And then uh, someone in Texas checked it out. And then someone uh, in England got this, got similar results. And so the, your skeptics tried to prove that you were wrong and they failed. So this is, this is how science works. So you say repeating the experiment. So it was possible for people. We said, so when you publish your paper, you have to say, this is how we do it. That's a methodology. If you do exactly the same, you should get the same results. And then people will repeat, repeat it. Now, if you did a pub, bad paper, and you didn't explain your methodology properly and you didn't control your experiment properly and you use some you know, weird methodology or something, people then cannot reproduce the data. They can't test your hypothesis. If you can't test it, it's useless. So you've got to tell people how they can go about testing it. They will test it in their own special way and they'll come back a year or so later and say, you were right. And that, at that point, everyone's citing your paper. So that, that's the process. So you can see how it would take a few years uh, for it to happen. But uh, what, what you're saying is correct. There's some very big papers that are published in Nature or Science. They are so complicated. You would have to have $10 million funding for four years for three diverse groups collaborating to prove it. And I've seen these papers. I saw one... Um, about the microbiome affecting Parkinson's disease. They had people with Parkinson's, they had controls, they had microbiome genomics, they had neurologists, uh, they had Parkinson's experts, uh, mouse models, you know, all kinds of things in that paper. I said, I don't believe it because it's impossible to test it, check it out. So now the NIH has funded it for like, $50 million probably, and the same sort of thing's gonna go on. So you are right. Uh, and uh, I suppose if you've got that kind of data, you could say you published it as a pilot study. It's like, I haven't got enough controls as a pilot study. And then get get it somewhere and get a review and, and work further on it. So that, that's about all you can do. So that's the peer review process. When you dis discover something new, everybody hates you and hates your idea. <laughs> so you have to be tough. And if you're tough and you really have got good data, you will keep fighting. But if your data is weak and you're not so sure about your methodology, you say, you say to your wife, I think I'll go into private practice. I think I'm gonna be a science <laughs> teacher. There's good money there. And it's a bit easier. You get 10 weeks holiday in Australia. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm, well uh, thanks, Paul. Uh, I'm sure many of you still have uh, many questions for uh, Dr. Marshall. But for the sake of time, uh, let's thank Dr. Marshall again, shall we? <laughs> Very nice talk. Thank you so much. So I believe you still have a video clip that you would like to show us, if I'm not mistaken. Let's just show that. My poor Mandarin. OK. Yeah, can you please Yeah. go ahead? Ha 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 
再祝大家二零二三年兔年大大利，万事如意。祝各位和我一样属兔的朋友们，大家一起大展宏图，前途似锦。And happy new year to you. Thank you, Dr. Marshall, and 新年快乐 to you too. So with that, we've concluded the first half of the day. I'm standing in between you and lunch, so just a couple of、um, housekeeping things again. We're moving back online onto the virtual platform,、um, where the Mechanobiology Institute will be sharing on what a mechanobiologist in Singapore does.、Um, for poster presenters, please do collect your certificates at the registration at the campus center. You can do that any time during your lunch break. Um, other than that, please enjoy, and then I'll see you back here at 1:25 for the next plenary lecture. Thank you. <laughs>